Pitch Johnson, welcome to the Computer History Museum. Today is uh, September 12th, 2019, and we have this much anticipated opportunity to bring your story into our collection. My name is Marguerite Hancock, and I'm the Executive Director of the Exponential Center. So, we want to begin at the beginning and ask you about when you were born and the formative experiences um, of your birth, your family, where you were born. Can you start us there? Well, when I was born, my dad had become the track and field coach of Drake University, which is in Des Moines, Iowa. And when the time came for me to arrive, my mother went to her hometown nearby of Quincy, Illinois. Not nearby, but pretty near. And so I was born in Quincy. I, I stayed there with her a couple weeks, I don't know, and moved back to Des Moines. So my childhood was really in Des Moines. And uh, I visited um, Quincy pretty often as a kid because my grandparents were there. But uh, so I uh, started um, grammar school in Des Moines when I got to be five. And amazingly enough, within a couple weeks, I was walking 10 blocks from my home on, over to the school. As a five-year-old? As a five-year-old. <laughs> I mean, I, I, my parents would have walked me the first couple of times, but after that, it was believed that as a five-year-old, you were uh, pretty independent. So I would walk to school every day, no problems, and uh, had some friends, and I went through the first six grades there. And then after school, I don't remember whether it was I was five or so, but very soon afterwards, I would walk over from Elmwood School to Drake University, tra the track, track and football stadium, and um, I would walk by myself. And um, and looking back on it, I wouldn't any more let a five-year-old wander around town like that. <laughs> but I did, and I didn't. I do. I wasn't scared. They weren't scared. I, and I knew I knew about crossing the street, and so I would go with my uh, about. 3.30 or 4, whatever I got out of school, and, and watch the track men uh, practice, and, 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 maybe, and just watch my dad working with them. And then he would give me a ride home in the car after that. So I, uh, I, I of course, you, you form ideas of what's what. Well, the, I thought a, what a, I didn't know what a university or, or was, but I knew what a track team was. Pretty soon I realized there was other sports. <laughs> that was a big revelation to me. And then finally I realized, well, a couple times I'd walk home from the stadium. And one time I walked through a biology department and I saw some things in jars, preserved animals and stuff. And I said, you know, there's something else around here. <laughs> I was waking up. It's hard to believe when you're just learning what's what. But I learned that the university was a lot more than the athletic department, and so I became aware of that. But I would say, while well, I, I enjoyed school and I studied hard, I did did fine. I was uh, always thinking that I lived in the track and field world. My babysitters were track athletes. My my dad's friends were faculty members, though. Then I began to realize that, and in those days, I would say the coaches were much more integrated with the faculty and the president of Drake University, whose name was Morehouse. Mm -hmm. his, his ancestor had discovered Morehouse's comet, by the way. But anyway, I just was a, I just grew up around a track and field environment. Then I began to realize more and more what else was going on. And I did enjoy school, I did well. So I did uh, do that. One interesting part of the first years was, um, my father became friends with a local sports announcer whose name was Dutch Reagan. And so they had a, a, a card playing group. There's a game called Pitch I won't describe. And then one of the members also was Henry Wallace, who was a rather <laughs> left wing, eventually, the Secretary of Agriculture under Roosevelt. So it's interesting to think of Dutch, uh, now Ronald Reagan, of course, in the same card group, but they were. And they come over to our house. But um, I was I was sort of excited about knowing a person who was on the radio, mm -hmm. <laughs> and who and the uh, we got to know the sports editor of the Des Moines Register. 
So when I was a little older, probably six or seven, why Reagan asked me if I'd like to go downtown and watch him broadcast a game. In those days, he would sit there and look at tape in the game between the Cubs and the Pirates, I believe it was, uh, and he would just announce the game as if he were there. I mean, one funny thing was he got behind, so he said, he said, so we'll skip over from the seventh to the ninth inning. <laughs> <laughs> and then he'd describe it as if he was there, but mm -hmm. if he were there. But uh, then just the next year, I, uh, he went off to Hollywood, and my dad and he stayed close. And so I remember being in L.A. in a hotel room, and I, he asked um, with my dad, and he asked Reagan up, and so I asked him a bunch of questions about the movies. There had been a movie called Brother Rat, and I asked him how the man got hit in the head with a baseball. He said, it's made of cork. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't want to go on too long, except that, uh, that he's the only president I've known well. And then when my dad was, many years later, was, and he was governor, my dad was dying uh, of, of cancer. Why? He wrote my dad the most beautiful letter of friendship, mm -hmm. and he didn't get there in time, but my mom got it. It meant a lot to her, and I still have that letter. Do you have that must mean a lot to you. But anyway, so uh, those first 12 years where I was beginning to learn lots of stuff outside of the track, mm -hmm. although I kept my, my focus, and I dreamed, my dad would be an Olympic athlete, he was a hurdler in 1924, mm -hmm. the Chariots of Fire Olympics. So I, I just, I guess, dreamt or hoped I would be of that stature. So. Uh, then in 1940, my dad got offered the track, and co track field coach at Stanford. And so we all came west in 1940. How was that to move from Illinois to a new state and to move from Drake to a new university? Well, from Iowa, basically. Illinois was the birthplace, but Iowa. Oh, excuse me, from Iowa, yeah. So um, it was quite a change. We first moved to Los Altos, Los Altos, a place called Loyola Corners but it was too far from the school that athletes couldn't come visit, so my, we moved to Palo Alto in 1941. One part of the living in Los Alamos, I was on the banks of Permanente Creek, mm -hmm. and Permanente Creek was called Permanente by the Spanish because it ran all year. And so they, they built a, it, it, historically, they, they started a cement company up Permanente Creek, and they, they called it Kaiser Permanente, and it developed a health care plan. Later on, when Kaiser adopted the health care plan for their whole company, they liked the name Kaiser Permanente. Mrs. Kaiser apparently liked it. So I, even today, I sit down with people from Kaiser Permanente, and one time at, with the president, they weren't really aware of why Kaiser Permanente is called Permanente, from a creek name which the Spanish had. So then we moved in 1941 to um, Palo Alto in the summer, and of course, in 19, uh, in December, a kid from next door came over and said, the Japanese have bombed Pearl Harbor. Mm. And uh, what did you I, think? I hardly knew what Pearl Harbor was, yeah. but I learned pretty fast, and then we started having blackouts and all that stuff, and this kid enlisted almost immediately. He was a high school kid, mm -hmm. senior. So. Uh, did those world events seem far to you to have thinking about well, Hawaii? Well, they seemed or? far then because I, I, I knew I knew my maps then. By then, I knew what Europe was and Japan was, and but uh, then uh, those see what was I be at forty one? I would have been in Jordan Junior High School. And by the way, that just if we could stop there, we didn't get your birth your birth date in year, and that would help us know how old my you are. My birth date was May second, nineteen twenty eight. A Thank long you. time ago, <laughs> and um, so, so uh, just to so I just went through Jordan Junior High, eighth and ninth grade there. It was a seven to nine, but I went to seventh grade in Los Alamos Grammar School, and then eighth and ninth at Jordan, and then tenth, eleventh, twelfth at Palo Alto High School. So as you were a middle school and high school student, was your world still revolving around track and field, or were there subjects well, that were of interest to you? it was for me, uh, in a way, but I, I began to get interested in my studies, and in, in high school especially, I had a really great physics teacher, mm -hmm. and I enjoyed learning why things happen in a physical sense, and I had some very fine teachers, including a, 
a, a lady named Louise Heatwall, who was really tough-minded about writing well. And so I, I have a lot of, I don't have them now, but papers were marked up pretty clearly with red <laughs> pencil. But um, I, I, I was a good runner in high school. I was a champion of the North Coast and in the 400, 440 yards. And we didn't have a state meet. And then my, in, in between my junior and senior years, I got, I got a kidney problems. So I, they wouldn't let me run 400, 440, but I did get to run 100 meters, but I just, I wasn't speedy enough, so, so I didn't do much my senior year. But, but Stanford, my, by then my dad left coaching in 1945, and I graduated in 46. So Stanford, however, wanted me to come and run there, and I did. Mm -hmm. And so I had a scholarship and a job in the girls' dorm, not all bad. <laughs> How'd you work that out? <laughs> so anyway, I, I went to uh, Stanford on a scholarship, and my, uh, my, my folks sent me some money, but it was a great experience. I had, I had no debt when I got out of school, which is unusual now. Very unusual. Mm -hmm. So as you think about your Stanford years, what are some of the things that were most formative for you? Well, I think uh, deciding to study uh, deciding to study technology, I did well in the technology courses. I became a mechanical engineer. I thought of majoring in physics because uh, it was the atom bomb time and all physicists were all the rage. But I, I just realized I really wasn't Robert Oppenheimer or close to it. But I did study mechanical and I got good grades, and then. When I got to be a senior, I decided I didn't want to be a design engineer, but I did apply to Harvard Business School. And uh, so the, it was interesting about that, though. I got into Stanford Business School, but Harvard, uh, so I had an interview. I said I didn't really know anything about business. I just wanted to go to business school to learn what business was. A very honest answer. Mm -hmm. And so I got a little thin letter later on saying, you don't seem focused to us. Uh, and so. Uh, we uh, think you should uh, learn more about what you want to do before you come here. So I went back east to Washington, D.C., by the way, to run in the national track meet. So after that meet, I got on an airplane, went up to Boston, and asked to see the admissions director, which I guess you could do in those days. He saw me, and I said more or less, it's, I really, it's really strange to me you rejected me. I'm a, a national class athlete. I got really good grades. And I, uh, I, I was very candid in my description in my interview. So after a, a, a while, well, I got a letter letting me in. <laughs> and so the funny part, when I got up, when I actually did go in the fall, I went right out of business, uh, college into business school. I went to see the director of admissions. And I said, thank you. I really appreciate it. I'm going to make, make the best of this I can. And he said, do me a favor. Don't tell your friends that you pounded on my desk and I let you in. But I think the fact that I was eager and showed a desire, I did Im impress them. And so um, at least let me in. But I love that thing, don't tell your friends that don't it's all compounding else. on my desk. <laughs> but I had a, so we, then. Can I go back just for a minute, back to your Stanford years. I was thinking about some of the people that you might have known on campus. Um, were you, you were there during the time with Fred Terman. Yes, Fred Truman was my dean. Was your dean, and I got I, to I know him. Could you talk about your interaction with him? Yes, I can. He was a he was a very interesting man. I hear he was a tough bird later as a as a provost, but as a dean of uh, of engineering, he was very accessible. I mean, you could I only wanted to see him I think twice during my whole time there, but I saw within a day he would say, well talk to my you know, assistant, and she'd say, oh yeah, can you come in tomorrow at 2 o'clock and all that. So he was not unavailable at all. And two, two things happened um, in my interview with, with him. I, I went to see him. Um, the first time, well, no, the first time I went in to see him, oh, to say, we had to take a course called Western Civilization turned out to be one of the most valuable courses of my life, actually, in terms of living your life. Mm -hmm. So I said, do we really have to take this soft stuff? He said, yes, you do. <laughs> he said, you'll, you'll realize someday how important 
non-technical training is to you. Mm. And uh, so I accepted that, of course. And another time, I think I won't mention the name, but I went to see, I said, uh, the culmination of engineering training is supposed to be machine design. And uh, I told him that the professor we had, whose daughter was in my high school class, by the way, um, was not, uh, was concentrating on the wrong things and only didn't let us choose our own thing to design. He, he only gave us three things to work on. My, uh, so a garage door hanging mechanism. And so he'd, he'd mark us off for not making good arrows on our drawings and all that stuff. So I went to say, look, this is, this course should be the culmination of the experience of all the courses you're ready for, machine, of, of, uh, of, uh, that, you, that you would take in an engineering course. So he said, well, the professor, it's his, his last year here. I said, also my last year here. <laughs> So uh, he, he laughed a little bit, but um, I would say the thing I'd say about Fred Turman was, uh, although I, I realized it's important much later, uh, he was accessible mm -hmm. and, and listened to what the students had to say. Very, very important quality. Thank you, and you had an association with Stanford, which later became such a powerhouse for technology and entrepreneurship, but at the time, those things, it was, that wasn't yet part of, uh, was that yet part of Stanford, or what was the well, kind of climate um, of the Well, by then, uh, Bill Hewlett lived across the street from us in Palo Alto, and I don't know the exact formation date of Hewlett Packard, it was before then. I think it was in the early 40s. It's 19, January 1st, 1939. 39, okay. Yeah. That's very early 40s. Yeah. And so Bill Hewlett and, uh, uh, and, uh, Dave Packard had already started it, and I just knew Bill you a little bit from being a neighbor. But he, they, by any measure, are the founders, along with Fred Turman of Silicon Valley. And uh, so I wasn't aware, I don't think, of the existence of Hewlett Packard. I guess that maybe I was by the time I got out of school, but uh, I didn't. I really didn't think about starting my own company or being an entrepreneur at that point. Mm -hmm. uh, and we didn't have any training in entrepreneurship. Very good training, well, except for that one professor. They're really good professors. So then I went off to business school, uh, and uh, the Korean War broke out just as I was graduating in 1950. Mm -hmm. So I got an exemption from the draft to go to business school. And by the time I got out of business school, I would have been drafted, so the Air Force happily came around and offered commissions to a whole bunch of us at Harvard Business School. So I went in the Air Force as a maintenance officer, not as a pilot. Mm -hmm. I became a pilot later and became an important part of my life, but in the Air Force I was a maintenance officer and of course... Before we go ahead to your, your experience there, had you had a job um, during your... Do you remember what was your first job? Well. Even my first a, job, summer, they were summer job. So I worked in a boys' job? camp um, for several years. What was your role there? I, I was a, well, I was two things. The first couple of years, I was a counselor. I had a cabin full of boys, and uh, two of whom were the Crosby twins. Bing Crosby had twin boys, and they were in my cabin. Oh, really? And they would always try to fool me, of, uh, pretending like one was the other one. And uh, I didn't meet Bing because of that, but I did meet the two boys. Mm -hmm. And we had other, the, the camp was based in Southern California, so we had a lot of movie people there. Mm -hmm. uh, then, then, though, I had a chance to become like an amateur cowboy, so I, I got assigned to the corral and, and took help to take care of the, There was a real pro cowboy, but I, I, I knew how to ride, but I learned to ride and take care of horses and, and um, 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 so I'd say I spent at least two summers doing that. Mm -hmm. I would I would be in charge of the horses as the boys went on a pack trip. Oh, I see. One interesting story was there was a kid named Michael Douglas, who was the son of Kirk Douglas, mm -hmm. and so uh, I didn't. I mean, I didn't. I knew that, but I you know, didn't know it. So uh, he got hurt on the trip. He fell down and broke his 
shoulder, I believe it was. So we had a pack horse. I knew all the horses pretty well. So I went to this pack horse named Blue. I said, Blue, we're going to put a saddle on you. And you're going to, right in the eye. Right he, to the by the way, I believe eye. he knew what I was saying. He didn't know the words, of course. But mm -hmm. I said, you, you've got to walk very carefully. You've got to take this kid seven miles back to camp. And we, I just want you to be very careful, very gentle. And you come to a log, step over it. Don't jump over anything. Mm -hmm. And this kid needs your help. So uh, I, look, I was looking right at the face. And um, so we, he did that. He just did he really? very, very careful. He was a great big draft horse. Mm -hmm. He wouldn't have been a, normally a horse should ride. So we got, then I went back to the corral. I gave him some oats. And, and I just put my, put my nose up and mm -hmm. said, that was so good. He he kissed me. He he put his nose up. I, I was very moved by that because here was two not human beings, two animals talking, really talking to each other. Mm -hmm. And the kid, by the way, uh, uh, got away from got. I don't know. I think he became a. I'm not sure, Michael. I think he was a director or something in the movie. I think he was an actor about. also. Or actor was yeah, he? I think so. So um, that kind of fame was because this camp had famous kids in it. But the relationship with Blue was, was, was a, I've always remembered that. I mean, and since that time, I've been around horses a lot in, in, in a camp my wife and I go to. And I've always sort of felt, you, 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 they're people. You know some of them, you don't know some of them. Mm -hmm. Some of them are nice and some of them ain't so nice. <laughs> but uh, but um, I think uh, high school, so what happened athletically I was was a number two in the Pacific Coast and ran a dumb race there to won it. And uh, I think I anchored our mile relay championship team. But it, it was 1950, was in between Olympic years. Mm -hmm. So I, I wasn't really anywhere near ready. And then I thought, well, I'll, I'll go to business school and work out like hell. And maybe I'll get good enough to make the team in 52. But once I got to business school, I, I was so loaded with work, I really couldn't work out. Well was enough. that a conscious decision for you to leave behind conscious, this yeah. life I, of track I had, and field? I had to make a choice, although I don't think I'd have made it anyway. I did run a little bit for the Boston Athletic Association in a couple of indoor meets, mm -hmm. but I just, that was the point in when track and field as a personal activity became less important to me. Mm -hmm. It always was high, high on my list. As a matter of fact, I, I talked when I was got into business school. I talked to the guys on the track team, and I said, "You know, I don't know any girls back east. I'm, I'm in east of Reno." So <laughs> luckily, one of them, my my wife of 65 years gave me her name, and so I uh, went to one day. I, she was living in New York, so she was going to Vassar College. But one time, I I was home there on a weekend. I called her, and she was home. So I said, "May I call on you?" Thought I better have a look before I asked her out. And uh, <laughs> you didn't trust Kathy, your you didn't trust your friend's suggestion. Kathy doesn't mind my <laughs> telling that story. I don't think so. Um, I won't. It was just it, it was not a whirlwind romance at all. Mm -hmm. One thing that causes smiles now: when your girl came to visit you, you had to find a place for her to stay mm -hmm. in Boston, mm -hmm. and uh, I did. And so we we went out quite a bit. But it took only it was three years later that we got married. So it was quite a extended and not easy, I would call it romance. So you married your Vassar girl. That's um, great. Before we get to Harvard, I think you also, did you have a chance to work in some steel mills? Well, that was, yes, was one before summer. before your Harvard days? But one summer, mm -hmm. because my dad went to work for a steel company as, a, as managing their agricultural properties. Uh, and so I did work in a mill, and I was in the open hearth down in Fontana one summer. Mm -hmm. And I was fascinated by that. So when I was graduating from business school, uh, Inland Steel came around looking for management trainees. So I interviewed them, of course. I said, I'm, I have to go in the Air Force now, but I'd be interested in working in the mill. I don't, I don't want to be a management trainee. I'd like to be a, to work in the open hearth. Well, the guy was completely fascinated by this at Harvard Business School. And so about a month before I got out of the Air Force, I got a letter from Inland. He said, do come to see us. We'd like to consider what we talked about two years ago. Mm -hmm. And so I uh, moved my bride then from Manhattan to East Chicago, Indiana. And I got a job working in a steel mill with the end point being 
uh, I become a manager. But one very important thing happened. My first day in the mill, uh, the superintendent, which is the big deal, guy runs the department, I mean, it's, it's hard to explain what a big deal is. Even with unions, the men depend on him, guys go to, if a guy gets caught at night, he'll call up the superintendent to come get him out of jail. Is that, I don't think it's that way anymore, but that's the way it was in those days. So the superintendent uh, sits me down, a guy named George Lawton, and he says, you know, Pitch, uh, we've had college kids here before. <laughs> and he didn't stop at that. He said, we're going to teach you how to make steel, but I'm not going to do it. The guys on the floor are going to do that. Mm -hmm. So I want you to spend the next several months getting to know them. You, I don't care what you learn a thing about steel. If you get to know the men and, and, and start working with them and they enjoy being with you, you'll learn how to make steel from them. About the best piece of advice I can, I was the eager college MBA type of guy. I was gonna go, he said, easy, easy, get to know the men. And I've, I've felt ever since then when I'm in a new situation, take a little bit of time to get to know the people that you are gonna work with. And it's, uh, you know, it's paid off. I don't know, paid off isn't even the right word. It's just made the whole thing more rewarding and enabled me to do, do my job, whether I'm a, a, a new director of a company, mm -hmm. but I take time to know the management, walk around the house floor a little bit, and uh, I just, uh, I've, I've used that advice many times in my life. Very wise advice. So as we think about your time at Harvard, did you have any particular professors that were influential or cl classmates during that? Yes, time? I did. It was interesting. I write, and right now, his name not coming to mind, but um, he was an expert in human resource management, mm -hmm. and he, he had came up with a concept. He was an assistant professor, very new then, but he had the concept of self picture. He said you self have to picture? know. Self-picture was his, what he called it. We all have self-pictures. And the closer you can keep your self-picture to, to, to the way others see it, and the way you really are, the better. Mm. And some people have self-pictures that are completely divorced from where they are. Mm. So I think that, that, again, was a valuable concept that I've tried to, I mean, of course, I've failed plenty of times and taught more of myself than, than reality. But I've, I've always, uh, and it's helped judging other people too. People that seem like they're for real and, and there's people that seem like they're blowing their horn mm -hmm. all the time. And I'll, I'm sorry, I can't think of this guy's name, but he became a very famous professor later. But he was a young assistant professor just starting out mm -hmm. when I was there. So I would say that's the most, of all the stuff I learned in business school, I would say that's one of the most valuable. Mm -hmm. Of course, learning about marketing, learning about, um, I remember accounting, Credits by the window, debits by the door. I remember that very book. <laughs> no, we, we had good know. accounting. But I had some very fine professors. Mm -hmm. I don't at all want to put them down, including George Dorio, mm -hmm. who was a who understood entrepreneurship. He didn't have a course in entrepreneurship, uh, but he did teach a course called manufacturing. But he brought in entrepreneurs as guest speakers, and I did. It did occur to me then that there were people starting companies. Was that the first time? Because he was, had he started ARDC at that time, or was that a I little? I think he had, yes. He had, mm -hmm. and was I that a new concept, the sort of founders and entrepreneurs? That's was, right. So I first heard about venture capital, and he didn't name venture capital, another professor did that, but in terms of practicing it, he's the first person I ever met mm -hmm. did that. He was, he was um, very accessible, like Terman. You want to see him? You can see him. On the other hand, he was always saying, he was always sort of giving advice on how to behave. But I respected him and liked him and uh, enjoyed his class. It was, I think it was a year long class, if I'm not mistaken. Maybe, maybe it was uh, half a year, but it was, it, was a, it was a good class. When you heard him talking about financing risk, in a sense, risk finance for early companies, did that? strike you then or with your love for venture it capital It struck me later. as something I didn't know anything about. I knew people started companies mm -hmm. and uh, but I think Mrs. Field had her and she was a cookie, made cookies and remember she talked about starting her business and a lot of other ones so 
The answer is no, it hadn't struck me. Of course I knew people started businesses, but I thought maybe drugstores and mom and pop grocery stores and stuff, that, that, those are businesses. But yeah, the, the idea of technology becoming, uh, one thing Doyle did say was very valuable is, is in this is you have to think of markets. People think of technology, it's very important, but technology doesn't mean a thing if you, if you can't, somebody doesn't want it or can be made to want it. And so I think he pointed out the importance of understanding the market when you're starting a company, and that was a very valuable piece. It's not obvious even now to some people. <laughs> We started to talk about your time in the Air Force, and you may not think of yourself as a military guy in particular, but you were there for two years. What difference two did years, that? Two years, yeah. Yeah. What difference well, did that have you, for your experience one there? One thing, I learned several things from being in the military. I think you, 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 it's the first time you have a sense of being part of something that's very large, mm -hmm. much bigger than you, mm -hmm. and I, like everybody else, will tell you the same story, but. The first time you're in a parade and you come to present arms and they play the national anthem, it gets you. Mm -hmm. I've heard the national anthem many times, but I was sort of like, it was introduction to the military and it was just moving. Mm -hmm. And I'm not too sentimental a guy, but, but I've talked to other people, just about everybody has that same, the first time you come to present arms and you hear the national anthem, you suddenly realize you are something much, much bigger than you, and you're devoting yourself completely outside of yourself. And I think that's something we all have to learn at some point. Yes, very powerful and important. Uh, then I think um, another thing that uh, I uh, learned later in the mills, though, but more, more, but uh, I remember when I was stationed in Sacramento and I walked on the floor the first time, a master sergeant, we, we have to, senior enlisted men run the military. I mean, yeah, the big guys make all the big decisions, but they the main things happen. So this master sergeant came up and said, welcome Lieutenant Johnson, we're glad to have you here. I've got the best mechanics in the Air Force here. So uh, he said, uh, just let us know what you want done and we'll do it. Which is nice. and the message was, don't tell me how to do it. <laughs> <laughs> so that's a pretty good lesson that I learned. Just I, I sort of knew it, but he emphasized. He didn't say the words, but I could tell right away he wanted to be left. He wanted to know what to do and what job. And he, most of it he didn't knew anyway. Cause it was a production line of uh, inspection and repair. But I think that um, that was uh, later on when I went to work in the mills just shortly after that, uh, sort of the same lesson. Well, let's talk that you went, you were saying that you returned to Inland Steel there. Uh, I'm sorry? You, let's talk about your time at Inland Steel. You returned afterwards, they had this position waiting for you and you stayed there for quite a while, right about. Yeah, what's up, so what happened was, they, they don't get many business school guys anyway who want to get into production. In business schools, I wanted to be a corporate executive. So you could get to be a corporate executive by marketing, finance, and production, and, and you know, various, and I thought production would be the right one for me because I had enjoyed my earlier time. I just liked the smoke and the flames and the kind of guys that, and women that worked in the mill. So I was attracted to it. And so I, I found it satisfying, shift work, is um, unusual because you you work uh, days, then you work midnights, and then you work four to twelve. But sometimes you have eighty hours off the way the cycle works. So we, Kathy and I, were, d didn't have any kids to start with. We'd go into town or something. But um, I would say those mill years my first exposure to actual professional life that I thought I was going to pursue. However, <laughs> Bill and Phyllis Draper, Bill came to work as a sales trainee, mm -hmm. and he took the, he was in the, you know, the overall management course, 
but we moved into, they had something called company houses. They could provide to young executives and senior uh, hourly guys. So we lived near each other. And Bill and Phyllis and Kathy and I became quite good friends. And I think I'll skip over, but we did things together. And uh, they had, Becky was already born, but Tim was yet to come. And uh, uh, Polly was yet to come. And um, so move forward from from 1954 uh, until 1959. Bill, his father, had started a pioneer venture firm in Palo Alto called Draper, Gaither, and Anderson. So Bill left at that point to go to Palo Alto, my own hometown. So uh, that big game that year, I went out and introduced him to my friends who are still those of us who are still around, became friends of Bill's. And then we came out for the big game in 61 and stayed with them, what we loosely call the big game. Yes. <laughs> and um, Bill and I, I think it may be, I don't know, he, he really loved his father and liked that work, but he wanted to be on his own. So I think he, he may have suggested, or maybe we just, it was natural. So we sat down at his kitchen table like hundreds of kitchen tables in Silicon Valley and cooked up this venture capital firm. How did that conversation go? Well, um, uh, it went something like this. The government now has a program called Small Business Investment Companies. And if we can get together a little bit of capital, uh, we can form an SBIC. A little bit of capital meant between us, we had to have 150, so it's 75 each. So uh, I had, uh, so I, my father-in-law had a great job, and, and and so I went to him with my heart in my mouth <laughs> and said, I'd like to borrow $50,000. And he said, uh, okay, well, tell me about, I mean, I tell him what it was. And so uh, I was able to do that, I had saved up 25, from investing, mostly in Cessna aircraft, by the way. I would made some money in the stock market, so we, I got my 75 together. Bill did more or less the same thing, I think. And so, it, the, the, so I, I figured I could do this. I said, Bill, I don't know if I can get together the money, but I did. And so in, in uh, the fall of 62, or the summer of 62, with my heart in my mouth, I left the mill because I, by then, I was assistant superintendent of a shop. I won't go through all the promotions then, but I, I spent three or four years working shifts, and then I became a general foreman, which was days, and then a, then assistant superintendent, just for a brief time. So the, the, I had been accepted in the mills, and I took this skinny track athlete and befriended him, I, if I could put it that way. And uh, so, I really hated quitting, but I realized that I had options on 42 shares of Inland, and I was, I was making, I don't know, 1200 a month, pretty good pay, mm -hmm. and but I I just thought, here's a chance to be on my own, an entrepreneur in a sense, mm -hmm. and to make some capital and to be on my own. So I really did have my heart in my mouth, and they wished me mail, of course, and I went off on my own. That was a big risk for you. Oh, there was plenty of risk, that's right. But I I somehow figured we'd do it. I just knew somehow that we could find some deals. First of all, there was very little money around, mm -hmm. very few deals. Mm -hmm. So we, 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 got some, we got some office on Welsh Road, if you know where that is. Mm -hmm. And uh, we got started and uh, we, we called it Draper & Johnson Investment Company. So we had a, didn't have much of an argument, so Bill became president and I was vice president because I was junior in the business. Um, I, I hadn't heard before about the source of your $50,000. Can you, about your investment in Cessna, and you, I know you have a long, No, I, I didn't of, make that, I made 25. Oh, okay. So Cessna was just getting going. And the, somebody, that they'd taken over Cessna, I think it was called the Blues Brothers. I tied back in much later in my life, but uh, they um, they took Cessna. I I had saved up a little, and over the I was I worked in the mills eight years, so I saved up some money. We didn't 
we had fairly cheap housing and the kids uh, came along, so they weren't exactly cheap, but they were. And so I, I saved up 25, I call it that, but it was, I would say probably, uh, if I just kept the cash, I might have had 10 if I got lucky. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I sold my Cessna stock, got my 25 and 50, and Bill put his in, and I did that, and we started that in 62. So this is the birth of what would become the first venture capital companies here in Silicon Valley, before it was even named Silicon Valley. Well, before it was named, but it was not the first by far. Not by far, but by some. By In other words, Bill had worked, his here. parent, he had his, father, his father, right? it started Draper, Gaither, and Anderson, mm -hmm. and it, um, it was, uh, had the Rockefellers behind it. I think they raised a grand total of five million bucks capital, if I remember the number. Uh, so they had outside money. Bill and I chose a course where we owned the company but owed the government money. Mm -hmm. And then um, uh, we can talk about some of the deals we did early, but uh, we did a, build a good enough portfolio that a real estate company called Sutter Hill it was wanted to go in the venture business. So a guy named Paul Wise, as you know of, uh, came to Bill and me, and they, uh, Bill wanted to go in the venture. I wanted to be an operator. I was tired of being a coach. I wanted to be a player. So we had very little discussion about my joining in Sutter Hill. So Bill and Paul, very early in, in the venture capital part of Sutter, the real estate part sort of folded up. That became important to me later. but. Um, I would say uh, we did enough good deals and we had enough of a portfolio, so Sutter Hill was able to buy our portfolio. I was able to pay off all my debts, <laughs> by the way. That's wonderful. And uh, I, didn't, I didn't pay off, the, well, it's a long story. My father-in-law died between the time he lent me the money and um, this event. So I later on gave all his kids and I, I paid it back and then some. Mm -hmm. but, I, I, but my official debt to the government, and I had a little debt left over from Harvard Business School. My first year, uh, I had borrowed money to go to Harvard Business School because I didn't obviously have a scholarship. The second year, though, they wouldn't let you borrow over $12,000. So they, I had a grant my second year. So I really didn't owe that much. And I paid that off and paid off the government. So I had a couple hundred thousand bucks clear, first time in my life by a long way. And so I began looking for a company to buy, but I ended up finding some deals to do on my own. But Bill and I had a good little portfolio, uh, and uh, we um, were- Do you wanna talk about your first investment that you made? together or any of those investments that you did together well, with Well, the Bill? first thing we did was a, with a guy named Joe Julie called Illumatronic. And um, it was just, I don't know how we met Joe exactly, but you know, one thing Bill and I did to drive Palo Alto in our, in our car and look for uh, company names that might be ending in ICS or something, we never really do it, but we, we visited people. It was sort of funny. We'd go in the front door and say, uh, we, we didn't say this, but do you like any money today? <laughs> but we'd say, we'd like to see the president. And they'd say, what about? I said, well, we're investors. And so we always got in to see the president. And we never did find a deal we wanted to do that way. Mm. But Joe Julie, I, I think probably Bill met him somewhere. Bill's the kind of a guy who meets people, by the way, <laughs> still. still. And um, so Joe Julie had a company that was taking wire and then shrinking plastic onto it to make coated wire. And so we invested in his um, uh, Illumatronic and it did, did pretty well. And then he, he also did later on a check wire. In other words, it was unrelated, but something where you could send packages of, they say cereal, down the line. If they, if they met certain weight, mm -hmm. you kept them. If they were too heavy, you took them out. If they were too light, you took them out. Mm -hmm. And uh, that, the check wire was pretty good. And much later on, a uh, related company, but not during our era, they made coatings for re-entry for missiles, 
for, for that stuff. That was not really why we got in it or part of what we did. But the the uh, wire coating and the check wires were two. Uh, one was called Lumatronic Systems and one was called Lumatronic something, but Joe Julie was the man's name. I think Joe's still alive, living in Los Alamos Hills. He's also 91, dig of the devil. Um, if, if I have the right Joe Julie. Mm -hmm. um, then we, um, we did a company called Coherent Radiation, a man named Alan Calvin, and it was programmed learning but there weren't any computers then, so this program learning was uh, page after page of making choices about things. And then Alan, that was successful, and it went public. Uh, and then Joe Julie, however, I don't mean Joe Julie, uh, I mean Alan Calvin, late, much later on, and unrelated to what, this, started Palo Alto University, which is a school behind Palo Alto, it was first named uh, the community was, was called something to do with uh, behavioral sciences. Uh, the Graduate School of Behavioral Sciences, but he f eventually called it Palo Alto University, and it's, it's now good size. It has an undergraduate program that Foothill runs, Foothill De Anza runs for them. So uh, I just, uh, in fact, I talked to, to uh, Alan Calvin, I couldn't remember the name of his company. I called him up. I said, what was the name of that company you had? <laughs> he couldn't believe I couldn't remember, but I wanted to remember it for this meeting. So now I remember it Good. the hard way. Good. Um, but uh, uh, other early deals, our two main deals were Coherent and, and uh, uh, Joe Julie's company. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and let's see, what else? I can't remember. We did two or three other deals. We didn't do any bad deals, which is unusual. That is very unusual. And uh, so, but when Sutter Hill came along in 1965, uh, they bought our portfolio, and we both went on our own. He went with Sutter Hill, and I went on my own. You were mentioning about your early role of working together. You had been friends for a long time, for years, and how did that work between the two of you? Well, it was interesting. Um, we're different people. I've gotten more outgoing, I suppose, in my later years, but we'd go into a room, and Bill would meet everybody in the room within 10 minutes, and I'd be standing by the door talking to one person. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so Bill was the much more outgoing, promotional kind of person. And, uh, but we got along beautifully because I think uh, it, it's unusual to maintain a friendship and a business relationship. I mean, it's hard Very to do unusual. that. Very unusual. Because you're, you're, but I wasn't trying to be, and Bill, neither one of us was trying to be dominant. We just did our thing and we went together and visited deals. And I, I remember I bought a new car for $1,000. I thought I was really something, doing something, a Pontiac. Uh, but, um, you know, we had our first office on Welsh Road, and the lady next door came in and said, Kennedy's been shot. And that was another t awful thing. But Bill and I, uh, so we stayed friends. Um, when we went our separate ways, really, but we saw each other all the time in a family way, and then uh, uh, tried to get Bill and me involved in Intel. That didn't work because Bob, we were friends of Bob Noyce. I was especially was a friend of Bob Noyce from, from a company called Coherent. Um, and how did that story play out? The story of, of uh, well, Bob Noyce, I've been on a board called Coherent with Bob. We were both pilots, and we, we talked about airplanes like all pilots do a lot. And also, he was a good director of, of the company, and, and, and Coherent was a, a deal that I did very soon after Draper and Johnson, but not during Draper and Johnson. Mm -hmm. 
So um, so uh, when we became good friends, and he said, "Well, I'm starting a company to make integrated circuits. I think you, I think you'd like. Be, I hope you'd be interested." I said, "Well, anything you're doing, Bob, of course I'd be interested." So I said, "Well, why don't you just take a? Because Bill and I had just separated. I think Bill would like to take some personally, and I would. But I say a couple hundred k. So he said, "Oh, that's so good." He said, if "Art Rock's putting the deal together. Give him a call." So I did give Art a call, and he said, "Well, call me back next week." And then I called back, called him back a week later. He says, "I've done the deal, and you're not in it." That's an exact quote, by the way. <laughs> so I fell off. So I called Noyce and. He said, Art doesn't want me in the deal. He said, oh, no, don't worry about that. I'll, I'll talk to him. So he talked to Art. Art said, am I going to do the deal or is Pitt's going to do the deal? Uh, that, that, that's not a direct quote because I didn't hear him say it. Mm -hmm. But I've, I've worked with Art many times. He's a tough but very honest man. He's not at all sl slimy or slithery, but he was really tough in this case. Mm -hmm. I think it wouldn't make – I think – I really don't know why. I think he wanted to have – People who were in the deal, when he beat people, he brought in and sort of got credit for that with them. But I don't know. That's that's a guess. But mm -hmm. uh, but, but since that time, I've worked with uh, with him on art on several things, and I became chairman of the opera, and I had to go knock on his door and get some money from him. Anyway, <laughs> that time he did. How did that go? <laughs> yeah. But that's the story. That uh, it's part of history. I, I think the company would have done any better or worse with me on the bo board, but I wasn't. Mm -hmm. Well, you mentioned that you had had a, a desire to, to be an operator, to be the player and not the coach, and yet when you started asset management, you went back into investment. How well, did what you, happened was how did that work? I began to look for, for a company to buy, but I found deals to do. I was in touch with a guy named Prentice Hale, H.D. Thoreau, who worked for him, and he'd He'd run the, uh, the uh, with, with, behind the uh, Winter Olympics, uh -huh. and I, I just I'm not the Winter. I love the sports. I just haven't, haven't been to a Winter Olympics, but um, so they. Uh, uh, let's see what what was the first. Oh, I know what happened was. Um, I don't remember how I heard of it, but, but coherent radiation was just about the first deal. Well, I know how I heard of it uh, because of it's another interesting story. Because of my father-in-law's job, which running a company called Standard Oil in New Jersey, mm -hmm. he knew the, the, the Rockefellers. Mm -hmm. So um, I was in New York trying to get going, and I heard they had a venture capital arm. So I asked. Oh, I know, I know. I'm, I, I, not even quite it. Charlie Smith was on the board of Coherent Radiation, which is the deal I did very soon after we split. I don't know how I heard about that. And so Charlie Smith said, "Well, you ought to meet the people in our office." So then I went to my mother-in-law and said, uh, uh, "I'd like to to meet." Lawrence Rockefeller. Well, I'm, I'm a little vague on this, but somehow or other I got an appointment with Lawrence Rockefeller, mm -hmm. which everybody around the office called him Mr. Lawrence because everybody was named Rockefeller. <laughs> Whole family. So I sat with him for about a half hour and he talked about some deals at Eastern Airlines and things they'd done. Very, very open and friendly. So I said, well, thank you very much. Uh, I appreciate your time. He said, well, you have to leave? <laughs> I said, well, no, he said, I thought you, he said, oh, come on, you can spend a few more minutes with me. So then we talked for about another half hour. This is in the afternoon. He said, can I give you a ride home? I was staying with my in-laws up the street. So he dropped me off at, at their house. But uh, I, of course, I, uh, I, I think I met, hmm, uh, Charlie, Charlie Smith was a, a, a partner there and became a friend of mine. I believe it was because of coherent radiation. I've got my timing a little mixed up here, but anyway, uh, I was um, I was aware of the Rockefeller family and associates and their activities, and so uh, I I just began to hear about deals and do them myself. Mm -hmm. 
I had a couple hundred thousand left over from paying off my debts, and I'd never had any capital before. Um, so when you think about the way that you wanted to, to operate under asset management, your very own firm, mm -hmm. but you founded in 1965, did right. you have certain principles or strategy? It sounded like you've been very opportunistic and driving around Bill and looking for technology. Good companies. question, but it's really hard to have how things were. There, there were very little, very little money and very few deals. Mm. So I just, I just heard about deals. One deal I read about in the paper. I called up the guy and eventually did it. I mean, that kind of stuff. And I, I went to lawyers and accountants and said, I, I want to make some investments. Please let me know if you've got something. So I got some leads that way. So, uh, but I think my, I think coherent radiation was my first deal outside of Draper and Johnson, and um, then I stayed on the boards of a couple of things we were already in, but I don't remember them. But um, then I, uh, I, because of Prentice Hale, they had invested in a company called Chromatronics in Berkeley. And they were doing, uh, they were doing uh, chromat high, uh, liquid chromatography, mm. and so I got involved in that one. There's two parts of that story that are interesting. Um, it was right during the Vietnam War, and I, be, I was chairman of the board, although the board was about three people. And I was over there visiting, and the guys in the lab were wearing wearing Viet Cong hats. Hmm. Which I thought, well, Surprising. that's sort of weird. <laughs> then I saw they they tacked the American flag upside down. I said, guys, I'm not going to tolerate this. And he said, you can't tell us what to do. I said, I'm going to make sure you get that flag right side up. Hmm. So I went to see the president, Dick Gundelfinger, who was a Berkeley type of guy, but I think he was sympathetic with him. But he, he so they, I went out with him and made him put the flag. They called me a fascist, of course. <laughs> But all I was doing was, I'd call it normal patriotism. I wasn't even normal. I just, it was, they, they had done something abnormal. They can wear all, any hats they want, but they're those conical Vietnam Kong I hats. I do. So, uh, but that, but th that was an interesting part of that. And they did, they did well in designing a, a pulseless pump for liquid chromatography. Then they got a, a very assistant professor at Lee Hood. They got a hold of him to advise them. And this is the part that led to much other stuff, that, although not in that company. He pointed out, well, this is also I'd taken a course in 1964 about, in Stanford, I took two courses, I took three courses, one in molecular biology that didn't exist, one in computer science that didn't exist, and then one in, in uh, partial differential equations. I don't know why, quite why I did that. I didn't do very well, but I did well in the other two courses. Mm -hmm. And so I knew, I was aware of the fact you could take non-human genes and put them in, I'm sure you could take human genes, put them in non-human organisms and make uh, human hormones. Well, that's, that's, that's not even worth talking about now, but it was really, really new then. Mm -hmm. So when I got to, in 1960, wait a minute, it's two, three, four, five, so when I um, got to meet the, the uh, um, guys at Chromatronics, they had, they had begun a contact with an assistant professor named Lee Hood at Caltech, and he had, had th told them, you can probably uh, analyze proteins and figure out what DNA or RNA com comprises them. Uh, and uh, so, what, what genes do. And then he had the idea that you could assemble proteins, and finally the idea that you could assemble DNA into, uh, into genes. And they, they started doing some of this stuff. And he, of course, he became a famous guy, is now the head of a, of a, of a research lab in, in, in Seattle. But they didn't, well, they were acquired, I can't remember by whom, but who was in, something was interested in all this stuff, and so sure. I got out of that that way. But I think, uh, I think chromatronics was among the first things I did as own. That and coherent radiation were. 
Well, in your, your time as a VC, I read in one place that you, the count of investments you had made had topped 250. Is it even higher today, or is that a good estimate? Well, you know, the last few years, what happens now is we have a venture fund that's part, sort of part of our company. And to start with, Kathy and I were the only limited partners. And to start with, I was very active in doing deals, then I became veto power only, and then finally, they, we just put some money with them and they do it. But they now have some outside investors. And they're, having a new, they're putting a new fund together right now, as a matter of fact, we'll be investors in it. But the answer is, I'm, I, I just, I don't have the patience to do the detailed homework that you gotta do to check out a deal. And so I have a terrific guy working for me that does that. And, but we're not really doing deals anymore. The, 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 we have a, a fund that's run by three guys, a generalist, a computer science major, and a cardiologist. And they, they are doing the deals, and they're mostly, I would call them computer-oriented healthcare companies. But the answer is I'm not doing the deals. And so people send me, I just, send them to them and say, I'm not doing deals anymore. So as you think about the companies, you mentioned a few of them, but if I were to make a list of your highlights. Well, one, one your Tandem deal? is certainly a highlight. I was highlight. gonna say, how about Tandem? Well, and Tandem's Amgen, kind of funny because talked. you can hardly tell the story now with any credibility, but uh, Tom Perkins, who became very famous, mm -hmm. uh, had left uh, he had been at Hewlett Packard and tried to start a company to do a certain kind of computing. We, we called it nonstop. But for various reasons, Hewlett Packard didn't want it. So he and Jimmy Tribeg left HP, and, and Jimmy Tribeg as a technician and businessman, and started Tandem. So I got a call from Tom Perkins. Here's where the funny part is. He said, I'd really like you to be involved in this. It's going to be good. I'd like to have a named venture capitalist in the deal. Says Tom Perkins to me. Says to you, that's good. <laughs> Nowadays, that's a joke. But I guess I was well better known than Tom because he was just getting going in those days. So I went on the board of that, and Jimmy Tribeg was a superb entrepreneur and built this company around, uh, I, they call it nonstop computing. In other words, they had they put a group of computers together so that if one part failed, then the other part took over. And it was a good concept and it became a successful company and it eventually became part of Hewlett Packard. <laughs> it was acquired by somebody in, in down south and then they, it was acquired then by Hewlett Packard. So I ended up with a bunch of Hewlett Packard stock after all, okay. which I've used mostly, I did use mostly for gifts mm. because um, I try to do not heavily, but I try to do some charitable stuff as I go along. Mm -hmm. But I think Tandem, I met some very interesting co-directors, and it was very successful from a financial point of view, because I got involved really at the beginning, or near the beginning. So there was Tandem. Um, Did we talk about we don't, do we, Amgen, Teradyne? Well, Amgen's much later. That's later, right? Well, Teradyne. Teradyne? Um, I forget why I was in Boston for something, but I ran into a guy named Alex Darboloff, and he said that um, he wanted to sell some of his stock. He had started a company, and he needed some money. He didn't, the company didn't need any money, but he did. So I bought a not a big stake, but a pretty good stake in Teradyne. And he said, would you, would you go on the board? I said, yes. So uh, I was on the board of Teradyne for at least 10 years, probably 12. Mm -hmm. And it was, it, was, it made the uh, means for testing microcircuits. P probe, it made probes and testing equipment. Mm -hmm. And it was very successful and uh, it went public and I made it pretty good to that. But why I was in Boston, I remember, I do remember meeting Alex Darbalov, he's saying, well, I, I'd like to sell some of my stock because I need some money, but we don't, the company doesn't need any money. That had been AR&D, I think, by the way, an AR&D investment also earlier. Mm -hmm. 
Oh, I didn't realize that. Can you I say didn't, more? I don't realize it for sure, but I think so. <laughs> you, s you invested in so many companies. I was looking at, at one of the lists that has Applied Bio and Applied Micro and Biogen and Bipar. If, and if you take Amgen, Applied Bio, and Applied Micro, there are three. To what Bill Bowes, well, I knew him at Stanford. Mm -hmm. We became quite good friends at business school. We worked together, we did deals together. We, not deals, we did papers together and stuff like that. And so when I entered the business in 1962, I got in touch with Bill and we got together. I, in the middle of my, I stayed at his house in San Francisco and drive down from my base in Sacramento, even though he wasn't there. And so. I knew his parents very well. His mother was one of the first doctors in Northern California, by the mm, way. I didn't realize that. She and a girl named Josie Pitcher, who's a relative of mine, were the early doctors in, in Northern California. Anyway, um, we uh, did some, some, some uh, Bill and I did a couple of deals, but he had he thought up three companies. We thought one was applied molecular genetics, mm -hmm. which would use these techniques of of um, genetic engineering. Then he applied microcircuits with a company that would make a, a very sophisticated uh, microcircuit design, and applied biosystems, which was sort of related to what old chromatronics was doing. And he, I call it his applied period. Artists have blue periods, and but this was his applied period, and he asked me to join all three deals. And Amgen, in the end, turned out to be a super deal. <laughs> and I've, it's carried me a long way. In fact, I'd have been much better off to invest in Amgen than go fishing for 20 years, but I didn't. <laughs> I should have, it wouldn't have been bad. So, um, but I, I owe, Bill is now gone, but I'm very in debt to him for asking me into those deals because we were good friends. I'm not surprised he did, but mm -hmm. uh, those all were successful deals. Mm -hmm. Then, uh, what are some of the other ones you got on your list? Well, Chimerix. 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 CV Therapeutics. Liquid M. Mightier. Nuance. Uh, Nuance. Pharma Cyclics. PMC Sierra. Oh yeah, well I, I those are all names. Uh, I'd have a little trouble remembering the details of those, but. Um, uh, Verity. But. Ver Verity. Verity. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But these were deals, which we did in our company, but not necessarily by me. Mm -hmm. uh, much later, but. Uh, there's no particular tales about it. We heard about them some way and made the investment and came out. I would say that over the years, I have no mathematical justification for this statement, but if you did 10 deals, but one would be a, what we call, as a Midwesterner, old, we would call a barn burner. I mean, it just lights up the sky. And then there's about three deals that are good standard performers. They make five, 10 times your money. Or maybe, six. so that's about, oh, accounts for about a little less than half the deals. Then you got about three deals that just go completely broke, and there's about one, one or two deals we call the living dead. They don't, they don't succeed, they don't fail, and they just sit there and take up your time and money. You can't kill them, huh? Now, I can't give you the numbers that justify that, but that's about the way I've seen it over, over many years. You've played these roles of being investor, sometimes lead investor, sometimes you know, joining a deal. You've also been on boards, sitting with other different people. What are some of the approaches? You know, each good investor or venture capitalist has certain principles. Do you go for the jockey or the horse? You know, I look for certain attributes. What What are the things that guided your investment philosophy? I'd say. Invest, uh, entrepreneurs who show several qualities, the lead quality of which is understanding a market, understanding what people want or can be made to want, mm -hmm. but 
you, you don't talk about technology. Good technology, of course, is vital. And then uh, s some ability, demonstrated ability to to have a personality that people will want to follow. Sometimes they haven't ever been much of a supervisor, but you got to go by instinct there. And of course, you very key is personal integrity. You, you'd like to take men and women who've shown in, in their demonstrable careers no chiseling, no side dealing, just straightforward. And most people actually are that way, but you got to be careful of those who aren't. <laughs> but uh, now that it, now there's, there's quite a few women involved, I don't think I wouldn't characterize women one way or the other. But I think women that I've worked with in the last five years have been more alert to personalities. I don't know whether that's fair. I won't say all women are. I just say the women I've worked with have been much more alert to personalities and um, emotional needs mm -hmm. than the men have. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not going to generalize to all men and all women. I'm not that dumb. <laughs> but I, I would say that. And the other thing I've noticed, too, we're just talking about men and women, is women have not been afraid to look like women. They put a nice dress on and mm -hmm. put some makeup on and mm -hmm. comb their hair and, mm -hmm. and, and they look like and act like women. Mm -hmm. At least the way we think of women. <laughs> now, some don't, some are, some are very somber suits and no lipstick and all that, but I think that's great. I mean, go ahead and be uh, dressed and feel like a woman mm -hmm. because there's a lot of advantages in that. And, and I mentioned that some, many women are better off in sensitivity to personal issues. Mm -hmm. I'm sure that I'll get in trouble for saying that, but that's what I really think. <laughs> well, I'm glad you're saying what you think. Uh, as you think about, um, you've talked about the attributes of entrepreneurs and the importance of ma markets, and you also had a unique kind of seat to look at the evolution of technologies, and you had brought with you this background in engineering and a, a long-time interest. How would you characterize the Valley's evolution in technology and the role that you helped build it and you were on a front row driver's seat in its Well, I haven't done much personally to developing technology. I have followed it and read. I think I've kept up with what's going on. Lately, it's harder and harder. Sure. But um, by picking companies in which to invest, which are moving markets forward with new technologies, Many of us, but I've had my little my role in backing some companies that succeed. When companies succeed, the te that technology moves forward. When the company fails, that technology doesn't much go anywhere. One interesting thing is artificial intelligence. I invested in an artificial intelligence deal at least 15 years ago. It went nowhere. It um, it was too early. Mm -hmm. Nowadays, it's hot. Yes. But so. Um, Ed Feigenbaum was a Stanford professor, very strong in this area, and he was an advisor to us. He said, I'm just afraid we're about 20 years too early. <laughs> he was right, but it always was 20 years too early, <laughs> much before that. But um, the, uh, the, the technology in the early comes from research. I mean, it is, the technology is a result of research. So. The, the research going on in university labs, in government labs, and in just academic activity, and now, to a certain extent, by big companies, mm -hmm. it's research, it's just knowledge. And that knowledge doesn't necessarily become usable technology. But a lot of it does. So uh, you, you, the country needs to be sure that it's paying attention to and backing research and keeping in keeping big companies encouraging to do it, backing government labs and government, I mean, having the government continue to support technology, much of which is done in universities, but with the government funds. And I'm a little, not a little, I'm more than a little worried that we're not keeping up with research. Mm -hmm. But uh, as far as the development of technology, venture capitalists have backed men and women who seem to understand the markets related to the technology. And those which succeed have moved it ahead. And of course, I can bring the biggest name I can think of, 
uh, well, uh, I would say Apple did more to change the way we live than any company I know of. Now, Facebook has, but I, don't, I never subscribed to Facebook because I didn't want to get that much email. <laughs> Turned out I was just as well I didn't. <laughs> but Mark Zuckerberg lives practically across the street from me in a nice, fairly modest. He just wanted to have a normal life. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I, I've never met him. I probably hate to tell him I never subscribed to his service. <laughs> but um, Steve Jobs' vision of how he could take technology he was a good technologist, but he wasn't an inventor, actually. Take the technology and put it different ways together and serve a market which he knew would exist if he could do it. So here we have something in our pockets that is, a, of course, a phone. Mm -hmm. yeah. it's, it's a calculator and even a computer. Yeah. And it's a camera. I mean, come on. That's, it's <laughs> changed the way we live. I don't, I don't go anywhere without my, my, my uh, having this thing with me. And I can access to the I internet in a world of information. <laughs> <laughs> well, while we're talking about important companies, we I want to go back to 1967 when you helped start Bull and Babbage. Oh yeah. Can we? That was a that was a I think the most important single deal in influencing modern business. Um, I got a call from a guy in John Bryan. He said he heard about some guys that were starting a company to, uh, to make programs, in this case, to make computers run better. Well, it sounds interesting. I'll go. They were down here, so I talked to them. It was Ken Colts and Dave Catch. And so we talked and talked, you know, talked and talked. And so I said, that's pretty good. Um, uh, and I don't remember, this is an important matter that I don't remember. I don't think it was me, though. Said, you got to get a better name for it, just Collins and Cash. So they, I think Ken Collins said, how about, how about naming something after George Bull? Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't know where Babbage came in, but Bull, sort of the inventor of software, and Babbage, this is overstatement, sort of the inventor of hardware. So we invented calling it Bull and Babbage, and uh, so uh, I and some other friends invested in, in it early, and uh, it went along pretty well, but they, were, they really weren't strong executives or marketing guys. They were good, honest, decent guys. Mm -hmm. So we, uh, I became chairman of the board, and we uh, got going on these, uh, uh, to make the IBM 360, was the important computer, and we, we made uh, a product called that made the computers run better than and the one that made them connect to the auxiliary equipment better. And we enabled people to postpone the buying of a new computer because they could make their old computer systems run better. And got, uh, I had a business school friend who was running part of IBM, and he pointed out to me that we were competitors of his because we were, they were postponing computers. But I think the important thing about Bull and Babbage, and one other company, by the way, I don't remember the name, we, we let people buy software. But up to then, you had to write all your own software. Mm -hmm. And I think the important thing about Bull and Babbage is you could buy software and install it and not have to write it yourself. So there were some business issues there, uh, but in terms of the concept of the market and the concept of technology of doing that was very strong. And Bull and Babbage eventually went public and merged out at a very good price. Mm -hmm. What was and the valuation? Do you remember? Pardon? Do you remember roughly the valuation when it went public? Well, I do know this. It was just under a billion, and then the stock went up over a billion. I said, well, we got, I didn't, you know, I didn't have that much, but it was sort of fun to think of a, a billion dollars. A billion dollars <laughs> in that era, so early. Right? So we, it did very well. Mm -hmm. And a, a guy named Bruce Coleman uh, was brought in to, to run and did, did a good job. But I, I like, I, I think of all the deals I've done, 
I, I think Boo and Babbage, at least, I had a lot to do with what happened. And, and Boo and Babbage changed. I mean, not to talk about selling software, that's everyday business now. And I think we got that going. I've got most, I can't think of the other company. There was another company started doing about the same time, but I would say of all the deals I've done, Boo and Babbage had more effect on the computer business than any, anything I've done. Well, that's, I'm so glad you had a chance to tell that in detail. Did you, <clears throat> can you say more about, because you, you were not only an early investor, but you were with it, and as you said, you really helped shape it. Do you want to talk about your own role? In what? In, in Bull and Babbage. Oh, well, my role, as it had been on many companies, when we were getting going, to meet weekly, as I did in Tandem, by the way. Tandem had a big beer party at the end of every week. Those so are I'd famous. I'd go down and <laughs> sacrifice my time and have a beer and talk to the owner, talk to the members. But I'd, I would visit Bull and Babbage once a week because those guys weren't businessmen. They were, I've always wanted to have somebody who can run the company, uh, a different company, but we had a guy come into a meeting one time and say, I have three courses of action. I'd like the board to tell me which one. And I said, no, your job is to come to us with a course of action. If we don't like it, we'll tell you. But I, we're not going to, this is, uh, I, I, I realized right then the guy wasn't an executive. He, but anyway, in, in Boole, so I'd go down there and they made decisions about marketing and selling stuff. And I, I finally realized after a few months they just couldn't do it. Good people, I'm not at all knocking them as people. So um, I insisted that we bring in someone who was trained as an executive. And we found this guy, Bruce Coleman. I'm not sure how we got his resume. I just maybe. And we brought, and Bruce did, did a very good job of shaping it into a, a company. And uh, he left eventually, but Paul Newton came in to run it. And he's the one that got it public and, and took it and sold it. But, yeah, I, I, just to repeat myself, I think of all the deals that I think of where I may have influenced the course of history more than any other, it would be Bull and Babbage. Interesting that as an ironic part, so both Dave Cash, who has long since died, and Ken Collins, who has died recently, Ken made a few tens of millions. Let's say, let's say 10 or 20 million. I don't really know. And so he started his own company and blew every penny of it. Mm. So he was working in a hardware store downtown. Mm. And I used to go in and chat with him. He, had, he, feed his, he could feed his family. And he, but I just thought, you know, this is Silicon Valley is so full of stories of a guy with massive homes and 10 cars that people should see this more often that sometimes you don't make it. Now, he made it in his first deal, but not when he went on his own. He just didn't have the stuff. Well, I'm glad you mentioned that. Um, the journey, everything is always, isn't always up and to the right, is it? <laughs> and we don't, because of course, as I said, as I said in my earlier loose statement, three or four deals out of every 10 fail. Now, I haven't had that result myself lately because I haven't been that close but but you just have to you, you you have to have the guts to shut them down when they aren't working and I don't I mean I remember a really good guy named Craig Taylor worked for me for a long time not, not a long time five or six years and then went on his own but he said to me a couple years ago you know I had to unlearn something from you what I said, that? there comes a time to shut a company down, not put any more money or any more effort into it. And you're not good at that. He didn't say it that way, but <laughs> so he said I had to unlearn that. And that's, Do you think that's fair? A fair description? I think it's fair, although sometimes you can be in a company 20 years and it makes it. But I'm in a couple of deals now that are one way or the other over 20 years old. And I think one of them is about to go public. And one of them has spun off some pretty good companies, but I think, I, I don't think of those in particular, but I could do better and say, okay, this isn't working. Let's go home. 
I wanted to ask you about, we've talked about some of your favorite deals, the ones that have had the most impact, some, and some of the deals that you may not have been invited to include in, but there are also maybe some stories that you missed on, uh, maybe Genentech or others, but you had been in the space. Do you want to talk That's about That's right. Genentech is an interesting one. Yeah, so could you I talk about well that? I was well aware from that course I took that did something like Genentech so I was, a guy was working with me at the end called Brooke Byers, you know Brooke Byers. Mm -hmm. And later on became, of course, very well known. But at that point he was working for me and he's the one I went down to look at Tandem. I sent him down there and he liked Tandem and he eventually met Tom Perkins. So he left later, far later to join Tom. But uh, when uh, he said, you know, um, uh, I'm, uh, heard about this company that Tom Perkins is studying, mm -hmm. or backing, called Genentech. And I think, you know, uh, but I said, well, let's try to get involved in that. That sounds great. He said, no. His roommate, Bob Swanson, was, he said, I want to get involved with my roommate's company. They both improved their roommates greatly later. <laughs> <laughs> but um, so I became, uh, we didn't do Genentech. And at first, I thought, boy, was that bad. But then when Genentech, when uh, Amgen came along, I was able to do that. Yeah. And of course, it wiped out any regret. So, But I've had things I didn't pursue eagerly enough. I, I heard about Apple in the early days, and I thought, what, what, what would you use a computer in your kitchen? I mean, recipes? I, mean, I didn't have enough imagination to see what Apple could become. And I, when, um, Stanford was thinking about coming involved. Well, Steve Jobs came over to see me to talk about, I was working with Stanford on some things. And so my wife loved Apple everything and really thinks Steve Jobs is, so I didn't tell her he was coming. So we're walking out the, we met in the backyard and we're walking out the front door and I say, oh, by the way, hey, Kathy, this is Steve Jobs. And she goes, <laughs> But I wasn't a big buddy of his, but I knew him pretty well. And uh, he, he had di dinner in a, in a rather bad Mexican restaurant down across from the, of the f Whole Foods pretty often. And I'd see him walking from his house to the store, which he'd like to do. But I never really, I should have got involved later in when St Steve was coming back. I probably could have talked to somebody or done something, but I, I was so screwed up at that point, I didn't. So, But I wouldn't say I just missed it. We already talked about one that I did miss, but not from my own efforts of Intel, um, of these great big deals. Um, we started a company to compete with Microsoft, and we lost. <laughs> I, I'll shorten that down, but Microsoft beat us out. I saw the need for a program to help computers run. Mm -hmm. And I still have um, a little thing from, you know, on my, I don't know where it is now, we moved desks, but it said to Pitch Johnson champion fundraiser, but from the company that lost. <laughs> so I didn't in get involved with Microsoft. Um, I thought for a long time I had just missed Amazon. So the guy who took my place, and we got to talk about my teaching at some point. Yes, right? that was we're going to very get important to that part of my life. Next, um, he said um, that uh, when I had lunch with him a couple years after he took over my course, um, we're doing a deal. Which the guy wants to sell books online instead of in a bookstore. And I said, oh, huh? but uh, it sounds like a good idea. So for years, I thought it was ta I thought it was Amazon. It was some other deal they did. Oh, is that right? I always thought if I had pressed my luck, but I, until just a, last week or so, I've always thought, well, I blew that one by not. You, if you work hard, you can get in most many deals if you try hard enough. Mm -hmm. So uh, Pete Wendell is this guy's name, and so I can't. I, I spoiled my own story by learning the truth. Oh. <laughs> He was here recently to help be a moderator for a discussion uh, featuring Tom um, Scott Cook and 
Tom Pru and Eric Dunn about into it. So Pete was just here a few weeks ago. Well, let's speak, speaking of him, since you're both on the faculty at Stanford, let's turn to your okay, teaching let's career. Do that. Uh, and when uh, we were getting involved with Tandem, uh, I'm sorry, with uh, Sutter Hill, there was a real estate part of Sutter Hill, uh, and um, the guy who had been teaching an entrepreneurship course at Stanford, uh, uh, an amateur, not a faculty guy, was called Greg Peterson. Mm -hmm. And so Greg called me one time and said, I'm taking a job in Canada. I don't think we're going to move ahead with Sutter Hill uh, real estate. So I'd like you to think about taking my, over my course for a year because you could do it. And so, so I went over and interviewed some people at Stanford and, and the Dean and Jim Van Horn and others. They said, I think you could do it. Why don't you do it? So I did, thinking I would step back after a year. Twelve years later, <laughs> I got Pete Wendell to come and teach it because but it, it was, so there were several things about that experience. I began thinking about venture capital in a systematic way. Mm -hmm. In other words, what are the elements of it? What do you need to think about? And um, I, I, that was helpful to me. To, to teach something, you've got to study it. Mm -hmm. Second thing I realized, you learn as much from the students as they learn from you, maybe more. Mm -hmm. Because we had case discussions. We didn't have I had a few lectures, but it was almost all case discussion. And the, the insights these people brought to the discussion was very good. And um, I think that, well, it didn't do much in a business sense. I think, I'd like to have my wife comment on that, but I think I developed as a person <laughs> as a result of that experience. In what ways? Well, because I was, um, I listened better. I've never been a great listener, as most people will tell you. But after that class, it was supposed to be about listening. I was supposed to let them talk. And then I realized that some of them know what they're talking about. <laughs> Although there is a very satisfying thing in teaching that always comes along. And that is, somebody says something that you've been emphasizing subtly and say, hey, she really gets it. <laughs> oh, he really gets it. And that's a wonderful moment. Um, but I've had a lot of distinguished graduates. Right now, my most famous one is Joe Lacob. <laughs> okay, well. And as a result of that, although he went with Kleiner Perkins and did a great job for them, Joe uh, asked my wife and me to the game about once a year. Oh, so I'm, I'm hoping he'll ask me this year in the new location. But Joe and I have stayed friends, and I don't talk about it much, although I certainly am talking about it now, mm -hmm. but I've had, I won't even go through the guys. That, some guys are running big companies, some guys are prominent. About 35 of the 600 are venture capitalists, though. Is that right? Yeah. A whole generation that have venture capitalists? We had a lot of them go into investment banking, mm -hmm. and uh, I ran into a guy last night at a dinner. I said, uh-oh. <laughs> but he said hello and hi, so I shook hands, and it occurred to me later He's a guy from Grand Junction, Colorado, and uh, so I did, I did re eventually remember where he was from and what he was doing. But um, I don't want to go on and on except that it, there's two things about it. It developed me a lot, and I contributed, in my view, something substantial to the community, to the venture capital community by teaching that course, mm -hmm. by letting them meet each other, talk to each other, and guiding the discussion. If I didn't give big, I did insist that they calculate internal rates of return and that kind of stuff, and that they think about valuations and how you make valuations. So there was content to the course, but I think there's enough of them out there in, in investment banking and corporate work that, of course, all the other professors influenced them too, but I, my private ego trip says I, I sort of influenced them too. Let's, uh, if we could now f talk about your role in the industry, the venture capital industry. <clears throat> you very early on helped develop with a, a small group of people what would be known as the Western um, Association for Venture well, when, Capital. When we got right? going in 62, mm -hmm. uh, I heard about some venture capitalists were meeting in the city every month. Tw I think it was 12 or so. 
So I started going to those meetings, but only about, I would say, eight of them or six of them were venture. The other guys were real estate guys who, it was, you know, people didn't think about venture capital as that sort of a thing, separate from the, so, but I got to know uh, some people uh, at those meetings, mm -hmm. including uh, uh, the guys from, uh, oh, <laughs> I can't think of the name, but I, I got to know some guys in those meetings, mm -hmm. and um, it, it sort of made me feel like part of it. And then um, be, just before, so I was active as a director of the Western Association of Venture Capitalists, and I was elected president just before Bill and I sold out, so I had to step down and not take the job as president. Mm. But the Western Association of Venture Capital is still going, by the way. Then, then I got involved in the National Association of Venture Capital very early on, although not the earliest, and it's had a tremendous role in educating people and in educating the government. It, it's a very strong lobbying organization. Yes. I don't want to use that word, but it's the, it's the word. So we've influenced uh, the government in some ways to make it more friendly, more useful to be, to, to have venture capital be taxed properly and to uh, have it um, not controlled too much. Because to, to, we have a great history in our country of people starting companies. John D. Rockefeller, <laughs> among the greatest. But eventually he got so successful, his company was broken up. And now um, these guys, uh, Jobs and Bill Gates and Mark Zuckerberg, and the, and the others, we could start naming them all, they become very successful. And now they're believed, and I think in some cases, they're believed to be adverse to our society and to our democracy. Uh, I will say that but we got to, and we got to be careful of making it bad to be successful as an entrepreneur, because our we uh, while there's plenty of entrepreneurs elsewhere, we've got to keep the country wide open for new people to start companies, mm -hmm. and we and the thing we have to do is make it more open to everybody. In other words, we can't just have a few well-educated uh, technology guys and. But we do. We have to do a better job of making it open to people from other circumstance to get this chance. But we don't want to kill the chance in the in the first place. I will say, although I'm sure that I don't have the numbers right, there's a lot more women getting involved in venture capital and in entrepreneurship now than there, there's ever been. Mm -hmm. From my own observation, I don't have the numbers though. As you look at the way that the venture capital industry has evolved, not only personally, but through um, your work with leaders, by the way, we are so proud to have one of your, I think it was a holiday poster or something that you made with oh, Peggy yeah. Burke. That so in 19... The, the evolution of the industry. Yeah, 19, I believe 68, uh, I thought we should have something showing the history of one side the year and the other side the companies and people. Mm -hmm. And we made a poster uh, with the help of, a, of, of the art director of Bull and Babbage, who was a very fine woman. And um, she later on started her own company, 1185 Design. And pays great tribute to you. For, and pays great tribute and appreciation to you for the start and support that you gave to her. Is that right? Yes, she did for Bull and Babbage, and then, as she started 1185, Peggy said that you Pe were you were the one, Peggy Burke. Oh, I saw that. Yeah, did yeah. she send you that mail? Well, she uh, she had her oral history because she donated her whole collection of all of her design work of all the companies in the oh, valley yeah. over time. And she, when she was talking about this, she said, "My the, my career began when Pitch started introducing me to other people." Well, what she did, I asked the management of Bull and Babbage if she did the work after work, could I, could I employ her to design this poster? Mm -hmm. And so, um, so I got the okay, 
And so I gave her the information and sort of the general thought, but she's the one that made that poster look good. But Kathy, my wife, did a lot of research. She'd be, she called all those people. I never forget, she sent out questionnaires. I never forget, I heard her really getting after someone for not sending in his questionnaire. And that getting after guy was Art Rock. Oh. <laughs> But uh, Art did send it in eventually, so I don't think we're missing anybody significant, uh, anybody at all, really, mm -hmm. from those early days. But there was 25 years of venture capital. Uh, Very that poster, powerful. That poster, is, people put a lot of them up in their offices. It's and up place. in our. It's is up it? In you our, have one here. Mm -hmm. I can show you. It's up on our but team. Peggy Burke team's is room. just, as you point out, I didn't know you knew it. She's retiring, I think, this year. This year, the end of this year, December. Well, one thing she's done. We have a few friends, perhaps more than a few, the night before Big Game when it's here. Mm -hmm. And so she's always designed the invitation to that. So she's going to do it one more year. I don't know what we'll do after that, but 50 years of it. Um, 25 occasions, but 50 uh, uh, elapsed years. Amazing. So as you think about the evolution of the in venture capital industry, you've seen it change in stage and size of funds and emphasis and you know, boutique and specialist and add-on. What's your view about the way that the industry I is have evolving? A view. Um, venture capital used to be defined, at least in my mind, by starting and guiding young companies and providing them with enough capital to get going, spending time with them, guiding them, and being rewarded if they grew up. But Naturally, as it became a successful model, people saw these 10, 20, 10, 15 percent returns on average and much bigger returns in some cases. Uh, money's looking for work all over the world. And when New York woke up to it, they said, wait a minute. <laughs> and so, so they started doing backing venture funds with lots of money. We never went that way, we stayed private. But um, and they began getting returns, and then people people managing the money liked getting those fees and and the share of the money of big deals. So I won't go over it all, but I think I think roughly speaking, probably millions within the '60s, tens of millions in the '70s, hundreds of millions in the '80s, and, and billions in the 90s and up, it's up now, it'll be, if you define loosely enough, mm -hmm. it will be over 20 billion this year. Mm -hmm. And, um, but it's not the formation of young companies, it's, it's a money business now. In other words, guys put in money at 500, well, not that much, but 400 million or 200 million at a 1.2 billion valuation and hope that it's gonna go to Three billion mm -hmm. when it goes public, and then they make a lot of mo a pretty good return on a lot of money. Mm -hmm. um, I could say that's not really venture capital. It's just, but it's honest. It's decent. It's open. Mm -hmm. and everybody knows what they're doing, but it's not. It's, it's it's and the fact you can get a lot of money in a young company now mm -hmm. lets people start companies without the risk of going broke in that year afterwards. On the other hand, uh, there's companies that get valued highly and then when they finally try to go public or try to be sold, they're not worth so much. There's one right now that's going through that. And um, I, I, I can't say that it's not venture capital, but it's really more private equity and, and speculation now Honest, decent. There's nothing wrong with it. I'm trying to say that, but it isn't what I call venture capital. I guess I'd say that. But they, call, but the thing is, it's called venture capital in the newspapers, and that's what there's 20 billion going into venture capital. Let's talk about Silicon Valley. You, people around the world, look to the Valley as a place, a sort of an epicenter where technology innovation and economic value creation through entrepreneurship have come together, and so many people 
want to know the recipe or the DNA of the valley. What's your explanation for why here and not somewhere well, else? How it got going was several factors. Here, mm -hmm. uh, there was a, a leading research university, Stanford, but Cal was around here and UCSF eventually, by the way. Mm -hmm. These are major research universities providing and talent to form companies and providing the technology in the case or the research that leads to the technology. And so that, this is, I'm talking about just after World War II in the, in the 50s, say. Mm -hmm. um, then there was the uh, culture of, of people having moved west over the decades, being willing to try things and maybe not succeeding, and the tolerance of failure. Mm -hmm. People didn't oversweat failing. Another thing uh, was the weather was great here. So guys that went to the Pacific would stop here for a couple weeks and they say, hey, it's sunny here. Too sunny lately, maybe, but, but it's, um, the weather is good. And then at a national level, they didn't tax capital gains too heavily. You could get rewarded for building companies. And so it was a, it, that was true everywhere in the country, but but uh, it just these things came together of of uh, talent. Uh, by the way, I forgot to mention the supply of engineers that comes out of a place like San Jose State and what they used to call uh, what do they call it now East Bay State or something. I don't remember the name, but 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 Cal and Stanford and provided engineers and science. But these we had terrific young engineering schools that provided people. So you had this talent liking to be here, and, and so, but I think Fred Terman encouraging Hewlett and Packard, and people saw that example, that you could start a company and do well, uh, were what made it good. But it's, uh, it, I, I credit Stanford for a lot of why Silicon Valley is here. Now, Silicon Valley has moved all over. San Francisco is an important part of Silicon Valley now. Yes. And I, when it was started, because I don't, I, I remember the, I don't remember the names, but how it got going in electronic news, and mm -hmm. I think somebody called it that, and it caught on. Don Heffler in 1972, right? He called it Silicon I, I Valley. I don't know. Don it Heffler? It was, yes, yeah, Don yeah. Heffler. So that explains, we, we've talked about sort of the catalyst, and yet the Valley has had to recreate and reinvent itself through different waves of technology. And as you look at how do you explain that and do you have concerns about the future for what might come next? How sustainable well, is this model? I think the cost of labor here is going to prevent much in the way of manufacturing. I do think that will form companies here, the engineering, much of it can be here, especially the fundamental engineering will be here, but I think the world is waking up to this. And people in all over, the, I gave a talk in Poland last year to a group of people interested in starting companies, and there's a nice, around Cambridge University. So it, it's, it's not, we're not gonna hog it all, and we're gonna maybe not grow as fast, but I believe if we keep our wits about us nationally in terms of taxes and encouragement and regulation, we will continue to have Silicon Valley as a growing, vibrant place because it, it's so interesting to live around here. But we ha at a national level, we can't go overboard with taxes. We can't punish people for being rich too much, or at all, really. And we can't over try to control what businesses um, are starting. You've been involved in other regions and other countries because they've wanted to draw on your expertise in Eastern Europe and others. What have you seen as you've gone to talk with people there? What's happening there? And what lessons, if any, can you bring back from those regions back to the valley or, or ones that you've taken from the valley there? Well, I think because when I first started going up, Bill Draper was had left 
Sutter Hill became head of the United Nations Development Program. And in 1990, he asked me to go with him and talk to um, the presidents of or senior people in Romania, Bulgaria, Albania, Yugoslavia, and Czechoslovakia. Mm. Yugoslavia then and Czechoslovakia then. Yes. Uh, and I did. And um, people were, well, Albania was very backward, still had a communist prime minister, and so it wasn't sort of ready for this. But most of those other countries began to see, and, and, and Poland, I couldn't go to Poland, but there was, the trip was to Poland as well, have seen how useful it is to start companies to serve the local markets first and international markets afterwards. Mm -hmm. And Russia, I got involved in. Uh, Russia is such a place where things are controlled so much, but the, there's been some good companies started in Russia. And we, I helped, I got involved in a venture fund that a friend of mine was starting. So I went to Russia quite a bit to be involved with this fund. But the answer to your question is, we're gonna do okay with the competition, but there's gonna be competition all over the world. And the places I notice it now are England, France, Germany, Poland, China for sure. Mm -hmm. Although China is an interesting, we don't even have time to talk about China, except to say that China has very large freedom of uh, economic activity combined with very restricted ability to speak your mind and say what you want to do. And they're trying to control the economy and they're certainly, uh, with artificial intelligence especially, and 5G, they have moved ahead. I don't know if they're ahead of us or they can stay ahead, but they have, by government action, have decided they want to emphasize those areas. And, um, but, Everybody's scared of them, and they should be, but I think we can do the things here that will enable us to compete very well and stop them from being dominant in that area. I don't even want to get into politics, but we should be very careful in moderating our trade deals with them because they are a big market, and we're a big market for them. If we try to stop that trade, and I'm not saying Trump is trying to stop, but he's, he is interfering in the, in the process. Uh, it just has to be thought through very well and, and worked out with them. But um, the entrepreneurship is a worldwide phenomenon. Now, one interesting thing is when I first started working in Germany, it was unthinkable to fail. If you failed, if you practically, practically go to your farm and spend the rest of your life. Nowadays, it's much more normal to take venture capital risks. At one time, we were, we offered, uh, I think it was Bull and Babbage actually, offered to invest in a company in Germany, and they wouldn't take a deal where they could lose some money. So we had a deal where they were sure to make some money, and we had a hell of a strong deal from our point of view, it worked out very well, that uh, saved the in entrepreneurship taking any risk. Nowadays, though, there's all there's venture capital firms and there's deals started, and and I think they are less scared of failure now. As you think about your career, are there other highlights that we should talk about that we haven't? Other roles that you've played professionally? that you would like to discuss? Well, I think my term as chairman of the International Committee of, of the National Venture Capital Association was a good period. Oh, the rest of the, of the world was waking up to venture capital. And so we used to have joint meetings in London of the U.S. Venture Capital Company, I mean the uh, uh, WA, uh, uh, NVCA. NVCA and the 
European venture capital, and we get guys together. I think that period was a period of communication mm -hmm. between the two, and I, I played a role mm -hmm. in that. Mm -hmm. And I, um, I think that my activities on the helping form and guiding and supporting the Stanford Institute for Economic Policy Research called ECPER. Yes. It was formed originally to, to keep Michael Boskin in town, <laughs> but it has turned out to be a very significant place where ec applied economics is studied. Very significant. Worldwide influence, really, CEPR. Yeah. And the point was, we wanted to get American, I mean, U Stanford economists mm -hmm. heard on the national stage. Mm -hmm. But I get credit for one thing. What's that? That is, um, we kept Michael Boskin in town. Mm -hmm. And because Michael got in town, well, Chris Boskin and he were married. And Chris always be, gives me credit for for keeping Michael in town so she could marry him. <laughs> and she does. She practically every time I see her, she says, "Oh, pitch!" <laughs> but it's not uh, it's not my primary job. But it did is a side issue, an important one. Yes. Well. Um, let's see what else. Seeper. I've been active in Hoover, and I'm not. Uh, Are I've you tried still on the to. Overseers there? Hmm? Are you still on the overseers? The board? I am. Mm -hmm. And I've tried to, and I haven't been the one, but I've been anxious. When I first went to Hoover, it was sort of separated from the rest of the university. Mm -hmm. And while I've only been one of many voices, I've encouraged the later Hoover uh, uh, directors to reach out, be part of the university, get people in, mm -hmm. trade. And there's still, I think there's still resentment, and not in the economics department, but, but I don't even. I think, I don't know, some of the humanities that thinks Hoover's a, sort of a threat to uh, liberalism, I guess I'd call it. But mm -hmm. uh, I have enjoyed Hoover. I've enjoyed being a sort of a, a voice that doesn't mind arguing for the government sometimes. And I've, I've been on it for, I don't even know, 15 years or something okay. like that. Another area uh, where I have been active is the athletic department. Mm -hmm. I've supported and encouraged the track and field. Track and field has had a trans transformation. So at one point, the dual meets, where you'd have Stanford against Cal, Stanford against SC, Stanford against San Jose State, Stanford against UCLA, mm -hmm. and others, the dual meets were an important part of the season. And it was only later that the championship meets and running for yourself and being part of a team was exciting. Mm -hmm. But because the NC2A reduced the number of scholarships so much, for a very good reason, they were trying to provide the same number of scholarships to women. Mm -hmm. That's been a very important part of the track. But the, the absence of dual meets has changed the sport at the college level. So it's, it's kind of a, I don't know, people don't pay much attention to it. Yet they did. We'd have ten, fifteen thousand out for a meet, mm -hmm. and do a dual meet against SC especially. Mm -hmm. But there'd be fifty thousand for a football game. I'm not suggesting it's comparable, mm -hmm. but right now, except at the international level, I would say the newspapers and television doesn't pay much attention to college track. Uh, but you're you still are an avid participant in track and field. I think one of the times I talked to you, you were going to go see Usain Bolt. Is that right? Oh are yeah, I've seen him many, many times. And Usain Bolt, for world. instance, was was an investor in a, in a deal. A deal was done only a couple weeks ago to promote uh, sports, uh, uh, sports at a, a level. And Usain Bolt and Serena Williams both invested together. Oh, really? Yeah. But Usain Bolt made a lot of money and saved it. And he, he as a track guy, is probably one of the most recognizable, internationally recognizable names of any sport. And so at first, I didn't care for him because of his show off mm -hmm. after every race, but suddenly realized what he did was he made the international sport much more interesting. So these Diamond League meets, I watch them on TV, mm -hmm. and they have good crowds, I mean big crowds yes. to those. But like the Stanford Cal meet will have a few thousand people, if that, if, if a couple thousand, 
Is it, I think it's here this year, but it's an odd year. No, it was here this year. Mm -hmm. Next year is an even year. Um, but I've uh, I've contributed some money to the furtherance of the sport. I've gotten to know the track coaches uh, pretty well, and our coach just left. He left because he couldn't afford to find a house for his four kids here. It's hard he's, even that's with the he faculty said. housing. So he's, he's gone to yeah. So uh, I don't. I can't. College athletics is a mystery. Anyways, what's going to happen to it? I just saw this morning that the state has voted to allow athletes to be paid for the use of their of their images and their names, and they. Oh really? Uh, that's just in this, mo this morning's paper. Mm. They, they, the they wouldn't be paid by the school, but they could sell. They could they could get paid by a shoe company. By a sponsor. Interesting. By a sponsor. But I uh, I, I follow sports and of course. I've, I, I go to all the home football games, I go to many of the home basketball games, and uh, I go to all the track meets. But I, you know, I, I like the other sports just fine, I just can't go out every night. <laughs> well, I want to make sure that we cover some of the other areas of your life where you've contributed to the community. You've been very active in the education area, in the community college with Foothill and It's One of the most interesting was that very thing. I, uh, I belonged to a luncheon club in Palo Alto called the Palo Alto Club, and I joined about, oh, I don't remember exactly when, but soon the guys said, well, how come you don't do anything? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, what do you mean? He said, well, there's an opening on the community, Foothill, the end, not the end, the Foothill Community College Board. Mm -hmm. So I went and talked to some people over there, and I said, okay, I, I'll do that. So I ran and won. And then I, but one of the interesting things about and campaigning for that, I had to get the League of Women Voters to be for me, but there's an area of Palo Alto between the Creek and University and Middlefield and Alma. Mm -hmm. And I spent very little time there as a kid mm -hmm. because there wasn't much of, well, Palo Alto was there, Professorville and Crescent Park were a few people and down around Jordan there was a few people. So I, I had the experience of knocking on doors and say, hi there. I'm running for Foothill, and they always ask, it's amazing how friendly people are. Mm. They're not suspicious, they don't think you're trying to sell something. But I guess, uh, I wouldn't say I never got turned down, but I had a lot of fun just running. But I served 12 years, two, three, four year terms, uh, and during that period, it, we, we it was, the community colleges were free, they were supported by the state, so then, but the economics got so we had to begin to charge. Another thing that happened then was the Vietnamese arrived in mass mm. and they wanted education. Mm -hmm. They were used to having education and so we didn't set up classes for the Vietnamese, but we set up, we had to expand the size of classes so these people could take training in, mo in modern technology. And they began to go to work as technicians in the, in, the, in the growing businesses around here in the uh, 70s. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I also started teaching my class at Stanford. Let's see, I, I don't remember whether how much it overlapped, but quite a bit. Mm -hmm. So that, uh, that's the only real, I mean, other than a few committees here and there, that's the only really substantial community activity that I had. Well, how about your work with the opera? Well, that's that's uh, that's a cultural, yeah. Cultural. So I got interested in opera. One of my fraternity brothers had lived back east and liked opera, so he, he took me to a couple of operas. They just happened to be Carmen and La Boheme in my <laughs> senior year in school. So then I went off uh, to Harvard Business School, and I think I didn't go to any operas. I went to some symphonies there, mm -hmm. but I got interested in opera, and certainly didn't have a chance in the Air Force, but when Kathy and I got married, I was working shifts, and she was interested in opera, so this was in Chicago. We saw it went down to something called The Lyric, which is the name of the opera company there, and so when we uh, came back out here in 62, we right away started attending the opera, and John Bryan, this guy who introduced me to Boo and Babbage, eventually said, why don't you come on the board? I said, oh no, so I didn't. He said, look, we're going to ask you one more time, <laughs> so I did go on the board, and 
after serving on a lot of committees and meeting a lot of people, I became chairman of the board mm -hmm. in, I think it was 1999. And so then, of course, the 9-11 the, uh, came along mm -hmm. and people just didn't come into the city. So we had a very tough mm -hmm. financial situation. Mm -hmm. And uh, Carl Mills, an, an outstanding guy, was president then. Uh, Bill Godward was president when I started, but Carl Mills took it over. And Carl and I had to meet with groups of employees that said, stick with it. We'll figure out a way to stay alive. But people were worried about the losing, everybody losing their jobs because so they're just, here. so we, we uh, called on Art Rock and others mm -hmm. to tr drop in some money. I dropped in some and mm -hmm. everybody did. We kept it alive, but it was really a close, I don't think it was close call. Mm -hmm. uh, but in terms of time spent, I think that serving on the board, serving on the finance and executive committees, I still do that, even though I haven't been president for since uh, 2009 or something. Mm -hmm. Not that long, 2000, yeah, I think 2009. Mm -hmm. uh, but a very a, a great guy called John Gunn is now the chairman. He's doing a good job. He lives in Palo Alto also. Mm -hmm. But I would say that probably in terms of time outside of work, I've put in more time on the opera than any other single thing. But oh. the opera is a very satisfying art form. It, um, it takes human situations and magnifies them. And it makes you, you don't actively consider, oh yeah, I'm taking a lesson, but you're seeing people under stress behave a certain way. Of course, they're actors, but they do such a great job. And and music is usually beautiful that they do that in. So I like opera, and I'll continue going. Favorite composer? Favorite opera? Well, uh, I like the popular operas. I've, I've always liked La Boheme a lot, although I've seen it many, many times. But I've sort of descended on Wagner and The Ring mm -hmm. and uh, Tristan and Solda. I like Wagner's depth, mm -hmm. and I like the drama, mm -hmm. so uh, I think he's terrific. Uh, I, Puccini and Verdi, I, I like almost any of their operas, mm -hmm. but a favorite, I'd say if I had to pin me down as a favorite, I think the ring cycle taken together would be my favorite. Well, that's, that's a significant work to hear that all together. When well, was the I last mean, time you heard he was the whole one of cycle? Those, <laughs> he was a difficult man, not a nice guy by any means, um, and very anti Semitic, I might add. But he was one of the strongest talents. Mm -hmm. And he wrote those words too. Yeah, so he prodigious. wrote words and music mm -hmm. for his opera. So he was. The, even Israel's begun to accept him and having concerts mm -hmm. by him, and I don't blame him for not having done that for years, but in terms of just the music and the drama and the effect on you of, of, of it, and, and it wasn't, it, I haven't de detected in the work any kind of religious prejudice, mm -hmm. but I, I think I have to say in terms of his work, not his life, but his work, and his creations, I think Wagner would stand out. He's one of those guys like Shakespeare and others who just just leap out from the norm. We've talked about your professional world, your community service. Would you like to make any comments for your oral history about your family? Well, I have a terrific family. Uh, Kathy and I, as I mentioned earlier, started going out when I was in business school. And, uh, and, and when I went in the Air Force, I don't know, I didn't see her much, but she came out with her parents to visit. And uh, so um, I said, why don't you come to Sacramento? I, you can stay with some friends of mine. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard to believe that the, those were the days. It's only not that long ago, by those the way. Those were the days. But anyway, she stayed with some friends of ours called the Tisas. And then, I, and so I, I, I said, why don't you, enrolled at Cal. Mm -hmm. for, she was out of school already then. So Kathy enrolled in Cal 
for I think one or two terms. Mm -hmm. And of course, I managed to find my way from Sacramento to Berkeley. <laughs> Pretty often. <laughs> and it was, it was without going all the detail like any other romance, we did get engaged at that point. Mm -hmm. and, and then uh, um, we were married just when I was getting out of the Air Force. And it's sort of interesting, uh, I learned something about the military. So I, I, I went to the, I, di I didn't want to, they didn't have terminal leave in those days. If you had leave coming, you, you, you couldn't leave and then take it and then not come back. So I went to see the um, the sergeant, master sergeant who ran the, that office, and he said, oh, no, sir, you have to be back here on the day you're getting out. But I said, I'm getting married on June 11th, and this is you're talking about June, I think it was 21st, was when I, my anniversary of getting out would be. So he said, uh, by the way, he said, by the way, you owe us for, for volleyball. So I, <laughs> he saw it within his right. So then, because I, me and a lot of other guys probably would, I knew the general walked to his house for lunch every day from his office. Mm -hmm. So I managed to be on the sidewalk. <laughs> Just managed to be <laughs> when there. When he arrived at home and I said, General Hefley, I need to talk to you about something. He said, is it something you can wait till after lunch? I said, yes, sir. He said, be in my office at 1.30. I said, yes, sir. So I went and explained that uh, I was getting married on June 11th. Mm -hmm. I had a new job starting on June uh, no, June, June 15th I was getting out. And I had a new job starting June 21st. Well, this would be boring, except it's an interesting outcome. So um, he said, well, so, so I, I'm, I'm, I'd like to get transferred to this base near New York so that I can not only get married, I can go to that base and get discharged on the 15th. It isn't discharge, going off of active duty. It's not the same as a, mm -hmm. for, for an officer, you go, on, go off active duty. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I'd like to be transferred there. So he had heard enough of me, so he pushed a button and said, some guy called Major Grant. He said, Major Grant, would you take care of Lieutenant Johnson? <laughs> <laughs> and he just made a decision that he didn't want to fool with it, but he, he knew that if General, that General Grant, Major Grant worked out something. So I, I think I'll shorten this down, except that he said, well, I'll tell you what, when you leave here on June, I was started my leave, I think it was around June 5th, and then I had enough, I had enough leave to be, I had enough 10 days leave or something. Mm -hmm. He said, you, you uh, sign, give, sign all these papers now, uh, of, as of that date, and all you have to do is call me on June 15th and tell me you're alive. <laughs> so then we'll, we'll process you out. Mm -hmm. I kept my active duty card, by the way, which he probably should have taken. We got married and we were in, driving through Canada and on June. So I called up General Grant and said, I, Major Grant said, I'm alive, sir. He said, welcome. He said, well, I thank you. I said, I can't tell you how much it helped me. Oh, I know. The general had said to him, do we have any rules, Major Grant, that said the man has to drive 3,000 miles on his honeymoon? <laughs> <laughs> and so Major Grant says, well, no, sir. So he said, take care of me. So he did take care of me, and so I got out completely legally and didn't have to drive to Sacramento. Uh, but the reason I told that story is quite a honeymoon. I had a, had a nice honeymoon in, 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 in Canada. But it shows you that any organization, even the military, can kind of do things that help mm -hmm. people. And I've had a great affection, not only for those guys, but for the Air Force ever since, because they took care of me when the time came. They sure did. Well, we were talking about your family, and would you like to add anything else besides your wonderful Well, of course, we got, I married a wonderful woman. With, with Kathy. And we had babies. I won't go into every place of every birth, but we had babies in, married in 54, 55, 56, 58, and 62. And so um, there, um, uh, the one son got a PhD in, in, in chemistry and has his own company in the East Bay. Uh, my daughter is a very accomplished composer and singer. 
So she has a, a musical career going. She travels around the country si singing, composing, and singing folk music. She's coming out with her second record. Uh, my older son uh, has, um, he did a few things for a career, but I put them all in Amgen when they were kids. <laughs> so they've had the choice of what they do. That's lucky and he's, for them. He's, uh, but he's done, he's, but the thing I really like about our kids there isn't any of them are not good people. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Honest and decent mm -hmm. people. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, they get along, which is very important. But um, we're proud of them because I, I, you have to knock on wood. But so far, and I believe that we'll continue to be good, decent people, good citizens, mm -hmm. and not get in trouble. And the grandchildren are starting to come along. Uh, we had one just graduate from Stanford, computer science. Mm -hmm. Sort of interesting, he decided to take a month off. He'd worked hard, mm -hmm. I'm taking a month. So his month is about up, and he's working on a job, I think. But when you're a computer science major, the, the, some of the jobs come to you. <laughs> That's true. That's and then we have a really nice girl who's, uh, they were all born in Olympic years. 96, no sign of Olympics. Uh, 2004, the older girl is now uh, is 15, obviously. Mm -hmm. Really nice young lady, and uh, she's one of those student body presidents, uh, organize a play kind of people. Mm -hmm. And then her little sister is four years younger, and uh, she is um, um, she's going to be the scholar. She just likes to understand things. Mm -hmm. And then a little kid named Marty, who's uh, four, he's, um, well, he's just a normal grammar school kid. He, uh, he, he's fun, and right now he's all wrapped up in a soccer team, so he thinks <laughs> about that all the time. But the, the answer is four kids, uh, five grandchildren, one adopted, and um, we have fun with them. That's wonderful. We started today's session, and thank you so much, Pitch, talking about you when you were about that age, your birth, and here you are now with your generations of your grandchildren coming back or in their, when they're young. I'd like to ask you, just as we close, a few questions as you look back at your life and, and thinking about that your history will be here as part of the museum for generations to come, and as you think about your children and grandchildren and and not Did only anybody ever listen to this conversation. Yes, they will. <laughs> they will. We use these things for education, curriculum. We yeah. use them for exhibits. We use them for, you know, content to inspire the, the next generation. Um, what advice would you give if you had to distill it into one word? What advice would you give to an aspiring entrepreneur? Well, I'll use a fancy word, perspicacity. <laughs> okay. Um, but um, I think you sort of assume they're bright. He or she has an idea for a market and all those things, but times get tough. Maybe these kids that get tons of money don't have some tough time, but practically every startup will go through some kind of a crisis. And um, um, you have to say, I'm going to make this happen. I'm not going to give up. I'm going to do it. I think that quality, if it's missing, they don't make it sometimes, which they could have otherwise. So I think I'll pick, uh, I posted something down, down the hall that was similar to that, didn't I? You did. Persistence, I think, Persistence. is what you said before. I'm not sure persecuted that. I think perspicacity may not be the right word. I think persistence is probably a better word. But. Uh, that's the one quality that <coughs> all these people that we mentioned, famous guys and infamous guys, mm -hmm. uh, they stuck with it in t tough times. In your own life, we've talked about many of the high points of which there have been so many. But as you think about them, everybody faces dark times. Can you share a time when you had a, a dark moment and how By did you far, persist? By far the greatest was when my brother was in the Navy. Uh, and he was killed in an airplane accident. So thousands of families have faced death of, of a someone, but it was just a shock. 
the effect on my parents was just unbelievable. My mother couldn't cry. I said, Mom, you've got to cry. So I would say this is by far the lowest spot so far in my life. My parents died later, mm -hmm. but they were, uh, you know, it was normal life. I, I regretted it, but it was nothing like the shock mm -hmm. that we had. And Bill Edwards, who was a very close friend of mine uh, and a venture capitalist, I might add, uh, was so good because he had lost a, a brother in World War II. And so he put my mom in touch with his mom and they talked, I guess, a lot. And people that, excuse me, people like that coming to help you when you need it means, means so much. Yes. But I don't have anything that compares. I've had business failures, I've had uh, uh, not not too much. Oh yes, I my high school girlfriend kissed me off when we were so freshmen, but that was just as well because <laughs> I wouldn't have probably been with Kathy's been. Through, she was a fine girl and died on her birthday about eight years ago, her 80th birthday. Mm -hmm. But um, that was really nothing. That was just normal kid stuff. But and it doesn't even. I shouldn't have mentioned that in the same breath of the tragedies people have from losing people. I've, I've had bad deals, but they have never bothered me that much. Mm -hmm. It's just part of the business. Mm -hmm. And um, I've just had a very even life, and uh, Kathy's sort of slowing down her memory, is, so that's, that's tough at the moment. But yes. uh, we're dealing with it, and Kathy's dealing with it. And But it's, it's, certain, it's certainly no <coughs> tragedy, it's just a sort of a sad time, that's all. Yes. As you th think about all the many people <clears throat> who look up to you, who were some of the people, in, as you kind of summarize your life, that you, you admire or that mm -hmm. have been most influential for you? Well, like most guys, my dad was a super example. Mm -hmm. A fine athlete, a wonderful coach, <coughs> a father who you could talk to about stuff. And my mother was that way too. They're both super duper. But that's sort of, but I also, um, my father-in-law, a very successful executive, and he was someone who was a shining example of a guy who came from nowhere in a little town in Texas mm -hmm. and worked his way to the top of a big company. A great American story. But he, he showed me you can do this. And, and uh, I, he and I were close, although he, he died young. And he died in 1962 when he was 67. So we got to know all my kids except my guy who was born in 62. Mm -hmm. uh, let me, and um, uh, I, let me just think a minute. I think Fred Terman, as a young guy, was so inspiring and and re reinforcing, and I think you have to give Fred Terman pretty strong credit. I had a physics teacher in high school who taught me the magic of, of enjoying understanding phenomena. He was, his name was Hank Martin, and he was a tough guy. He closed the door, if he had an exam, he closed the door at eight o'clock. If you didn't get in there, or, I said, it was eight o'clock in those days. I can't believe they got us up that early. Uh, then, um, but I had some, uh, one moving thing there, our chemistry teacher, Mr. Youngerman, lost a son during World War II, mm -hmm. and we read about it in the paper. He came to class on Monday morning. Mm -hmm. I couldn't believe he was there, mm -hmm. but he just said, many of you know I lost my son, and he, wa he wants me to be here. That was a tough one, uh, but he was uh, inspiring with it, that he knew what to carry on. Let me think of, um, I had a wonderful mother-in-law, but you know, not particularly, didn't have talks with her. Um, I think that pretty well covers it. One thing we didn't talk about that we probably don't have t much time for, but as a result of, um, having got involved with the Rockefellers, I was invited to go to Cuba 
a long time ago, and I, I wanted to fly my own plane. So I got permission from Cuba in about 10 minutes, but from the United States to, to be able to fly there, I took a special doing. So we did, Kathy and I did fly there, and we, I gave a talk. Uh, this is not a particularly good clothing thing I should have included earlier. That's okay, we can, let's talk about that. And I actually had a note that I, we wanted to talk about your love of flying too, so this oh, is... Oh yeah, God, I've this, been a major gotta, factor We have life. to put but that in. Anyway, we, <laughs> we flew into there and I gave a talk and uh, Fidelito was in the, attended the talk, it was about 60, some military, some um, business and science and almost certainly some intelligence people, but uh, so I gave my talk, and we visited another part of Cuba. But when after I got a, a, a call, we were staying in some nice house that had been stolen from a sugar baron. But um, I got a call that said, the, the Comandante would like to see you. Well, I didn't expect it. And so, of course, I, I said, well, yes, what time? He said, 10 o'clock. That's at night. Well, Kathy has a hard time staying awake <laughs> past nine o'clock, but so we, uh, they can't set a car for us, and we went over there and went to his office. He was in his office, and we, we, we got by the guards and all that stuff. And so he spent half an hour or more talking about socialism and how they build this communist country and all that stuff. And, and uh, so, um, I said at, at the end of his, I would call it a diatribe, but that wouldn't be fair, that, you know, uh, we visited some of your fine labs, and there's enough good science there that the world could use some of it. And, and I've been involved in starting companies. I think you have the basis for some companies. And if, the, if the workers had some stock and the management had some stock, you could probably raise money and start companies. He said, Mr. Johnson, if we did that, some people would have more money than others. And I said, well, Mr. President, I didn't call it Mr. Common, I called it Mr. President. If some people have more money than others, but everybody lived better because of it, could, wouldn't you call that, um, uh, he, he just said he'd been describing social justice, wouldn't that be forward? He said, Mr. Johnson, I know those arguments. <laughs> and then for once in my life, I closed my mouth because I, he said, I understand you flew your own plane. I said, yes, sir. And I didn't say, if you, uh, he, said, he said, I've always wanted to be a pilot. I said, I didn't say, well, Mr. President, if you give the order, you'd be a pilot in 12 weeks. <laughs> but somehow I held my breath. But that was, a, I, went, I went again, I was invited back and I went again. And it was not so complicated getting permission this time. But he was, um, well, it didn't involve a visit with him, but it was exciting for me, who doesn't usually meet with heads of countries, to, uh, so, to visit with him. Of him, of all, of all countries. And I came, too. and I was given a little talk in Hoover, in a small room, and they announced it, and they filled up the, the auditorium. I gave this big talk about it, and I didn't realize, but uh, the people at, at Hoover had, some people at Hoover had been anxious that we open up to him more we influence him more toward capitalism by by letting him visit and let Americans visit, mm -hmm. and uh, but uh, they had a lot of private cafes there, but you had to work at it yourself. So well, that's an that amazing was, story. Yeah, the, the other the other visits with Bill Draper on that trip to Europe were either heads of countries or something. But I think I would think of this one as more than than any other. What about your love of flying and yeah. being a pilot? Well, uh, I, my dad asked me what I'd like for a 12th birthday present. I said, I'd like a flying, I'd like to go on an airplane. So he, we did that, or maybe it was 11, you know, my, one of those birthdays. And so I was terribly excited about it. And then... Um, Do you remember where, was it a, what kind of plane you flew on when where you went? Boeing 247D which was a, something like a DC-3, but not a DC-3. And then my, uh, we came out to Stanford. I mean, my dad did, and I didn't, I was, Palo Alto Airport had moved from Stanford Stadium 
to where it is now, if you, if you know where it is. It is. I grew up in Palo Alto, too. I huh? don't know if you know that. I grew up in Palo Alto, oh, it too. Is. So. So, well, that was before your time. It was by the stadium. Before my time, too. Um, then, um, when I got out of the Air Force, I was up in planes, and I didn't have the eyes to take Air Force training, but I just was terribly interested in it. So I, as soon as we got married, I started taking flying lessons, using my GI Bill for that, because <laughs> I didn't want to go to any more schools. And mm -hmm. by, by uh, 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 using my GI Bill for commercial flying lessons, it, it worked for that. Then uh, I just, I, I rented planes, I borrowed planes, and then finally I bought a plane called a uh, Duke. A Duke? Duke. And, uh, no, before I had a Duke, I had some other plane. Never, I can't remember all the types it was, but it was a piston engine plane. Mm. And uh, what had happened is Lawrence Rockefeller's son had bought it and flown it around the world. Mm. So um, I just heard that, that he wanted to sell it. So I offered him a certain number of shares of coherent radiation, and he took them. <laughs> so I, I got an airplane. So then I owned a plane, uh, and uh, then I, I had a series of airplanes over the years and accumulated around 6,800 hours of flying time. Mm. Flew everywhere in the world except Antarctica, mm. pretty much. And one time we flew over the Arctic, flew over the North Pole. Mm -hmm. But in eight, 19, when I got to be 85 in 2000 and, uh, when was that? 13, was that six years oh, ago? Uh, well, 85 and, and 28 is, is uh, so they started talking about my not flying, but they finally pulled my insurance and said they wouldn't insure me at my age anymore to fly, uh, a jet airplane. By then I had a jet. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I just had to quit flying and I, Harvard Business School had sent me a list of people who wanted to be in venture capital. So I wrote them back and said, you got anybody there who's a pilot or wants to be a, so um, I, uh, this guy's with me now, but he mostly spends most of his time on business matters and he flies. Uh, we have a guy running the airplane and full-time pilot, but we also have this guy and uh, but I had to interview his girlfriend, so I went back. Cause I had to pass her test <laughs> as well. What was your final flight that you were at the pilot controls? Did you well, have? That a was a good question. It was from San Jose to um, to um, uh, Hayden, Utah. That was near the place we go fishing. So then I turned the plane over to the guys and they flew it back. We stayed up there a couple of weeks and they came got me and I didn't. So I was, I was already questioning whether it was, I was insured or not, but I didn't want to, I, I didn't want to fly uninsured. That's sort of dumb. I, legally I could have flown by keeping up my physical mm -hmm. and taking the training, which I was passing every year. Mm -hmm. So I was a little surprised at the, the, I sort of understand it though. Mm -hmm. And, uh, so I've regretted that not flying has been a big deal. There's something any any pilot will tell you. There's something satisfying about a takeoff and a landing. And, and this in the, our, our our jet, why we'd fly three or four hours, or sometimes five hours, just sitting there. But it's absorbing. Mm -hmm. There's something about it. It's like fly fishing. You don't think about much else when you're fly fishing. And I don't. We spent about 60 years going to this place in Colorado, the same place every year. Mm, beautiful. Two more topics that are really important. Let's talk about your behavioral research lab. Well, a guy named Alan Calvin, who was a professor of psychology and uh, started behavioral research labs. And it was a, a programming company before there were computers. So it was just page after page of of, of studying, of learning by uh, examples that I gave. And it was a, if there had been computers, it would have been computerized. So he was, and he, uh, he did later, which we did discuss, 
he did later start um, the uh, uh, Palo Alto University. Mm -hmm. But the beginning of that and my involvement with him was his company, Behavioral Research Laboratories, which was the first sort of program learning I ever heard of. Mm. And uh, Jim Hobart took over uh, coherent radiation, uh, and it was a company that made lasers and used them for medical purposes. Mm -hmm. And it was quite a good company, and Jim guided it. There was a fellow named Gene Watson was involved at the beginning. I don't know quite why. Gene Watson was gone before I got involved, so. But Gene had a lot to do with the founding of it, but Jim Hobart took it over and ran it for a long time. And um, it was important because there's two things it did that affect you every day. If you have any surgery on your eye or in your internal that you need to do things, it has a laser to do that. But also, um, when you take a, something in, at the grocery store and check it out, mm -hmm. that, that reader mm -hmm. it was invented by Coherent. And we had big fights with the retail clerks union. We thought we were spoiling their lives, but it's just a normal advancement. And the, of course, the head of the retail clerks union then was called Catherine Johnson, but not my wife. <laughs> <laughs> but I think, I just, I, I think both Coherent Radiation as eventually brought to the fore by Jim Hobart, mm -hmm. and uh, 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 behavioral research labs were very important young companies pioneering in their field. Mm. Glad we added that, thank you. Seeing your phone reminded me of something else I forgot to ask you, which was you're such, um, so f facile with using your iPhone or your computer all the time. Do you remember the first computer that you worked, that you saw or that you used? What that was I your saw, point? not that I used. Either one, saw well, or I, used. I, I took a course, I knew about computers and I, I saw these card readers and that, but the first time I really involved in computers and program was a course I described, a course I took in, um, uh, I don't remember, I don't remember the name of the course, Computer or something, 101. And so we learned to program, learned about to, to reprogram, use programs. I took that in 1964 because it didn't exist when I was in school 14 years earlier. So what kind of computer were you using, do you remember? Yeah. I remember the program was called Algol and COBOL. I don't know what we ran them on, I don't remember. It was Stanford's computers, yeah. That's fine. Well, thank you. That's a nice bookend to seeing you there with your phone. Well, I um, have one last question about your life and one about the museum, and then we'll let you go. The one about your life is, how do you measure your life as you look back at it? Um, first of all, I'm very happy with my marriage and family, which is, you know, it's it's. That's most, not most of your, but most of your happiness. You, you've got a tough marriage or bad kids, it's hard. Mm -hmm. And I didn't have either one, I just find kids and a super duper wife. Um, in terms of uh, what did I do for the society, I feel good about the fact I played a role in the, in the development of venture, of venture capital. It wasn't a key role, but it was one of the important roles, I think. Yes. And that gives me satisfaction. I could have done something else, and I could have had a corporate career, but I'm glad I didn't. Um, I, Because I generated some capital, I've been able to give some money to organizations that I think are worth it. Um, but how would I measure my life? I guess I could have done more than for others than I did, because I was working hard for building companies, and in a way I was serving myself, but in a way I was helping people build companies. So you could, it's a complicated, but uh, I think uh, I'd measure, I'd be a good strong B plus, how's that? <laughs> <laughs> You're a hard grader, Pitch, but I thank you for 
the many ways that you've made a difference. And one of them is here at the museum. You've been a participant at so many programs. You've spoken from the stage, and you've also been a financial supporter. As you envision what the Computer History Museum can do to help society, what, what are your hopes for this institution? Well, it's something it is doing, but it's got to be continued to be uh, uh, emphasized, is getting students in here, mm -hmm. getting people to bring their classes, getting telling them what this is, what the history of computers is. Kids tend to accept what's there, and they have almost no concept of what's behind them. Mm -hmm. So I think not only getting them here to study history, but to talk about what's going on in computer science right now. Some of them will get interested in it, some of them won't, but they all need to know what's going on. So you don't look back only. You can look back, but you look back, and then you see what's going on, and then you, try, you can talk about the future, because I, I don't know what art, artificial intelligence is going, or 5G is. Kids have a little trouble understanding that, but they need to know what's, it's going on now, and it's going to be influencing their lives for decades to come. But I'd say keep building your collections, but emphasize education. It's a great vision that the museum is embarking is embarked on. So, Pitch, it's a great honor to add your story officially to our collection. And well, it's a great pleasure you. to talk about myself for a couple <laughs> hours. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much, Pitch. I hope you've had as much fun as I have. Thank you. Thank you. Enjoyed being here.